My name is Ebenezer Amwako Entry, and you are so welcome to this YouTube channel. On this YouTube channel, you are going to get videos that will set you up in your work with God and also with your prayer life. On this channel, you upload videos consistently to make sure that believers are guided to pray and pray and pray. If you are new to this YouTube channel, make sure that you subscribe to the YouTube channel so that when we upload new videos, you can have access to them. And also, if you don't understand anything, kindly send us a message and we will get back to you. Also, make sure that this video you are about to watch, you will like the video, try and comment on it. And when you are blessed by the video, make sure that you share it to someone. Thank you. <laughs> journey that we are going to have this morning, even by the help of the Holy Ghost, into deep places in the Spirit. Thank you for the engagement. Thank you for the interactions. We thank you for the supply of the Spirit. We thank you, Lord. Oh, Jesus, we say, be thou magnified. Be thou exalted. For letting us see your hand this morning. Thank you for the mighty things that you've begun to do already. Thank you for the many more that you will do. They call the glory, Father. They call the honor. In Jesus' precious name. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. If you are excited, give the Lord a shout of praise. Glory to God. What a beautiful way to begin a service. Wow. That was awesome. That was awesome. Glory to Jesus. You see, God has done so much already. From what the Lord has done, if we close this service now, the purpose has been achieved. Purpose has been achieved. Such a mighty outpouring of the Spirit of God. Great grace, servants of God. You know, I have the witness in my spirit to begin the service with an impartation of God's spirit and how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in Hammer. The man of God has picked it and he has made my job easy. I will just share the word of the Lord and then I'll sneak and be on my way to my body. <laughs> Glory to God. This morning we are going to try to establish premise premise upon which the kingdom of God is domesticated. Premise upon which sons and daughters of order will be beckoned by the Holy Spirit to come into a place of service in order to provide the needed kind of supply that the Spirit of God is willing to have in this dispensation. The moves of God are dispensational. Different, different dispensations have different supplies and they have different demands in the spirit. 
it will be a shame for a dispensation to be opened and there are no men, there are no sons of order who are willing to pay the requisite sacrifice in order to bring to bear the purpose of God for their dispensation. You know, Paul is a man of understanding. And he said in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13, he said, according as it is written, he said, they believe and have spoken. We also, having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. In the nutshell, what Paul was trying to establish is that the elders and the fathers, the patriarchs, have played their own part. We are not going to wait for them to come again. This is our time. And the very spirit that enabled them to carry out the assignments that they carried out for God is the very spirit that is at work in us. And we are willing to rise up to the responsibility of doing what our generation, our civilization, and our dispensation demands of us. In the days of Abraham, Abraham rose up and fulfilled his own quarter. In the days of Elijah, he rose up and fulfilled his own quarter. This is the day of Paul, and I will fulfill my own quarter. That was the scripture that was released there. Abraham will not show up again. Peter doesn't need to show up. This day is your day. And according as it is written, they believe and have spoken. We also, having the same spirit of faith, we believe and therefore we speak. You see, you go to meetings, you go to places, and then people keep calling on the names of patriarchs. They keep invoking the spirits of patriarchs to come on the scene. God does not operate like that. There are very peculiar cases where God had to unleash the spirit of patriarchs. And the reason for which God does that is because those responsibilities are tied specifically to those patriarchs according to the counsel of God before the foundations of the world. So for instance, in order to prosecute the ministry of Elijah, once and again Elijah had to be invoked to fulfill those mandates that were ported out into different dispensations. So when those dispensations come, the spirit of Elijah will have to man to a man in order to carry out that assignment. But such operations of God are specific operations. In a more boisterous fashion, God operates with people part time. And every generation that emerges on the frontiers, God gives them a measure of the spirit to carry out different assignments that are peculiar to their, their, their generation. And that was why Paul said in his own generation, he was going to carry out his own mandate. This morning, I want to bring you into an understanding of the fact that the things that God wants to do, the things that God intends to achieve, a quarter of it is resting on the shoulders of every one of us. And until we corporately agree together to form that quorum, that corporate ranking that is required to advance that counsel of God, it will not be achieved. So one of the things you'll be doing at the end of this service is to make up your mind to stand in the gap so that you will not be the weakest part of the link. Because the link breaks at the weakest part. And the strength of the, of, of, of the chain is judged from the weakest point. Every one of us is going to be empowered this morning in order to rise up and march together as a corporate army that is willing to extend the frontiers of the kingdom and to lift the banners of Zion. In the worst case scenario, God must be seen as the king and the monarch of Zion. And that responsibility is not going to come from heaven. It's going to come from earth. Because men are willing to stand for Jesus. And I want to tell you this morning that that man that we stand in order to ensure that the banner of Zion is floating in Enugu state is you. It's not Babalola. It's not Patrick Oman. It's you. It's you. The essence of the gospel is to give you the energy level that is required for you to stand. Nobody who did it was strong. Everybody that did it, did it on account of the supply of grace. It is grace that makes the difference. Women like Captain Kuman were weak. They were very weak women. They were praying. When you look upon them, you know that they are weak people. But by the spirit of grace, Captain Kuma could pace the floor for 18 hours speaking in tongues. It's not because she's strong. If you call a, a bouncer to pray in tongues for 30 minutes, he will sleep. Because it's a spiritual interaction. And until spirit supply energy cannot be achieved. 
everything God wants us to do is at the level of the spirit. So we must learn how to connect to supplies in the spirit so that our weaknesses can be exchanged for his immortal powers. That is the essence for the teaching of the gospel. And this morning, as we begin to travel through the pages of scriptures, we are going to see the role, the specific role that you will be playing. I will be saying one thing, the Holy Ghost will be telling you another. At different points, you are going to be hearing your own instruction. Because the instruction is not for everybody. Every one of us has something God wants us to hear. And when that point comes, you will pick your own by the Spirit of God. And the moment you catch that instruction, then you are in for a change. Give the Lord a big shout this morning. You see, last night I began to explain to us how that God intends for every one of us to be numbered in Him to carry out specific mandates. And I made us understand that for that possibility to find expression, we must all come back to the altar of obedience. I made us understand that man is a falling creation. We are fallen beings. And because man is a fallen creation, he cannot operate until that genetic mutation that has taken place in his configuration is reordered. And I told you the only way that mutation can be reordered is when the spirit is supplied. Are we together? In fact, I took time to show you the sequence of that denaturation that took place. And I said, the nature of man suffered corruption. And because the nature of man suffered corruption, he began to see after the sight of the eyes. And I told you that what you see is what you become. So the Bible called it the lust of the eyes. So you lost after the eyes. You see things that satisfy the serpentine nature. And the more you see that, the more like Satan you become. And I also told you the second thing the one that took place is the lust of the flesh. You develop appetites that were patterned after the systems of the world. And everywhere you go, your appetites are no longer of the God kind. You see, the appetite of the God kind is the appetite of fellowship. It's an appetite that tries to bring you, suck you into the realm of God. But the moment you fell, fellowship was no longer in view. Everything that you tried to do now was to take you away from God. And that is why if you x-ray your life carefully, you discover most of the things that power you, most of the things that motivate you to do the things you do. They don't draw you to the presence of God. That is the oppression of the falling nature, trying to find expression in you. It is called the lust of the flesh. And I told you the only way that could be achieved is if the spirit is supplied. He brings you back into obedience and suddenly you discover that you begin to have desire to stay in the presence of God. You see, when it began with me, I was in a noisy house. Every time they want to watch movies and they love seasonal movies. So they begin to watch from morning to evening, especially when it's written. But suddenly I discovered whenever Nepal sees this light, I become happy. I become happy because for the first time, the sound of the TV will go down. And people will now go outside. And then suddenly, there was a civilization brooding in my spirit. I didn't know that God was beginning to tackle the lust of the flesh. So instead of desiring to stay away from God, I began to desire to come into the presence. It is a hunger that is better when the nature that is falling is beginning to find the reconfiguration. If that has not begun, it means that you are still far from the path of spiritual progress. And I told you the third is called the pride of life. So you extray yourself carefully, you discover you don't do things because of yourself. You don't even do things because of God. You do things because of what others will say. So the very car you are driving is because of the people that will see you. See, the way you even drive the car, the clothes you wear, everything becomes about people. So you are drawn away from God. And I told you, the only way that all of this error could be corrected was to come back to the altar of obedience. And the altar of obedience does not only change you and transform you, the altar of obedience makes you relevant for God to use. And it is when God begins to use you that the supernatural dimension of your being will begin to find expression. You see, men like Moses, they were natural men. He was in Egypt, nobody knew him until he grew and became a man. But when that appetite began to draw him, when he began to draw him, a point came where he was drawn into the presence of God and he stayed there in the wilderness for 40 years. Do you know what it means to leave a palace and suddenly begin to live in the wilderness and you are not complaining? It means something has changed in your mind. 
You are no longer sleeping on the water bed. Suddenly you are sleeping on the rock. But even on the rock, you love it more than when you were on the water bed. You see, you wake up in the morning and people wash your feet and they attend to you. You don't even have to pick anything. You can't pick a pin. Somebody picks for you. And then suddenly you are in a place where you are now commanding ships. And then you don't feel it. The reason you don't feel it is because there has been a reconfiguration in your mind. And when Moses stayed there for a long time, the point came where that transformation hit his body and his eyes opened. And he beheld and he saw a bush burning and it was not consumed. You see, obedience takes you from naturality to immortality. A point came where the man of God could see the things that were happening. You know, a point comes when you, you, you are given to God until when you come to your room, naturally you begin to hear sounds. You are walking on the street, you see people and then you see something on them. See, that obedience has superimposed in your natural being to an extent that you can literally see beyond your realm. That's when men become supernatural. The Moses that ran away from Egypt could now come back to Pharaoh and challenge Pharaoh to let the people of God go. He was no longer a man. He had become a God. They part from humanity to Godness or Godhood is the part of obedience. God told him in Exodus chapter 7 verse 1, he said, Behold, I have made you a God unto Pharaoh. He was Pharaoh's subject, but now he has become what? A God unto Pharaoh. These were the points we were trying to emphasize last night. But this morning, I want to shift a bit further. I want to shift forward a bit. So that you will see the picture more graphically. You see, most of us, the gospel we began to hear was, For God so loved the world, that he gave his only people to do And whosoever believe in him will not perish for having an life. That's the only gospel we heard. And because that was the only gospel we heard, we felt that only God was responsible. Our own is just to receive and enjoy. I want to show you the background story. If you see the background, you know, if you are here when this building was erected, and you see the blocks that went inside, when you are in the room, you will not only be seeing the beauty, you will see the dirty job. If you see the background story, then you will know where you fit in. I want to show you the background story so that you understand what it means for a banquet when we speak of banquet. You know, banquet is a, a convergence of kings and his mighty men of feasting. The word in the Hebrew is mishte. Mishte means to feast, to drink and to celebrate. But you see, celebration is the last rudder on the equation. So if you don't know how to join it onto celebration, you will be excluded. You will talk about it, but you'll be excluded. So before we talk about the banquet, let me show you what happens at the background. The background story that you were not told. If you know the background story, you will understand why for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son became necessary. You know, that was not part of the original equation. That gospel you were told was not part of the original equation. That became necessary because of the fall. And then when the fall has been addressed, we go back to the original story. The original story is what you were not told. And that is why for some of you have been Christians for 10 years, but you don't have any fruit. You can't point to anybody standing because of you. You can't point to anything happening in the body of Christ because of you. But the apostles served Jesus for three and a half years, and they became apostles, and they took over their kingdom. Because God showed them the original story. The story began in the spirit realm. It began in the spirit. You know, today I will just give you a narrative of the Bible. I want to summarize the Bible for you so that if you pick a verse in the Bible, you can see the whole picture. If you pick a verse, you can see the whole picture. The story began in the spirit. You see, if you study the book of Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 1 to 10, you are going to see what happened. It is called the Council of the Godhead. It was a community of the Godhead. They sat together and they began to design creation. They began to say what they wanted to see, what they wanted to happen. And when they were designing it, according to the royal decree of God, he was formulating them as laws, as ordinances, and as precepts. Everything that God said was invoked into the creation and it became a law. It became a pathway that everything that was going to come after we follow. 
And in that chapter that was designed in heaven, God began from the spirit. And the very reason why God began creation was to derive pleasure from outside of himself. You know, the word God means self-existent one. He doesn't need you to be God, but you need him to be God. As self-existent one, everything that he wants and desire is in him. But God wanted to go on an adventure. And on this adventure, God wanted to embark on. He wanted to create something outside of himself that could give him pleasure. He wanted to see how there was a possibility for something outside of him could give pleasure to him. Because he had existed before existence began. Everything was himself. There was nothing outside of him. So for the first time, probably out of God's own curiosity. You know, sometimes you just sit down you want to do something and see what will happen. You know, we have the nature of God. The reason you just sit down and imagine something, and then you do it. Maybe you sit down and say, this evening, let me go and give myself a treat of fried rice and chicken with very chilled bottle of wine. And then you reminisce on it, you reminisce on it, then you just go. When you are taking that fried rice and chicken, and then you are taking the wine, then you find pleasure. You find See, God was existing as an entity of himself. There was nothing outside of him. So for the first time, he imagined, what would it look like if I created something outside of me? What kind of pleasure would I enjoy? That was when God began to embark on the mission. And because God was spirit, he began his project from the spirit realm. It was because of that project that angelic pattern was designed. God created beings in the spirit realm and gave them functions. Every functionary in the spirit realm had specific function that he was going to carry out in order to give God pleasure. Out of this angelic quadrant, they were splitted into three. We had the warfare quadrant, we had the mystery and the wisdom quadrant, and then we had the worship quadrant. All of these quadrants were headed by archangels. And of these three archangels, one of them is called Michael, the other is called Gabriel, and the other is called Lucifer. But because at the time God embarked on that spiritual creation, there was no war in heaven. The ministry of Michael was not necessary. Because Michael was framed to de and designed to embark on warfare. If you look at the physique of Michael, Michael is like an armory. Have you seen an armor tank? He was designed for warfare. So if you look upon Michael, you are going to see a warrior. Everything about Michael speaks of the strength of God. You know, God, can, God did not create anything that did not depict his nature. Because he cannot function outside of his nature. So even the angelic beings carry different dimensions of the natures of God. And what Michael represented was the strength of God. If you looked at Michael, you will begin to imagine what kind of strength this man is made of. This being is a totality of what strength is, what power is. And the reason for that was because he was designed to mirror the power and the almightiness of God. Gabriel, on the other hand, was designed as a reflector of the wisdom of God. You see, the wisdom of God is the template upon which everything that God designs, everything that God does, finds expression. You cannot understand the wisdom of God except it is given to you, even if you are a spirit. Hope you know that um, if you come to this camp, if you are smart, you will know, you will in a way discern what the man of God tried, is trying to achieve. It's evident that he loves people and he wants to see people grow. He wants to raise people. So he put his money, he put his time, he put his effort. Do you understand? So if you look at it, you are not giving anything. He organized everything and said, come. So you will just know the wisdom at work. The wisdom at work is the outworking of love. A love that wants to see people grow into stature in God so that they can become responsible. It's not difficult to discern. But it's not like that with the wisdom of God. When the wisdom of God is operating, if you try to discern it from here, you will discover that what you are trying to see here is actually here. So when you fight here, what you are trying to fight, you are actually bringing it to pass. So if you try to understand the wisdom of God, the more you try to understand it, the more foolish you become until it is given to you. That's why the Bible said, if the princes of this world had known, they would not have crucified the, the Lord of glory. Because the wisdom that was operating was that Jesus was going to bring salvation to the world. But the devil saw that Jesus was trying to destroy what he has created, so he wanted to kill Jesus. The more he tried to kill Jesus, the more he brought that thing to pass. He thought that killing Jesus would destroy what God was doing. But he didn't know that killing Jesus was actually the gateway to open that which Jesus came to do. Because Jesus said, I, and if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. The only way Jesus was going to be lifted up is was for him to die. So Satan became the agent that carried out that thing for God. That's how the wisdom of God operated. Now, if you look at Gabriel, Gabriel is the personality of wisdom. So every time God wants to reveal a mystery, he sends Gabriel. Because through Gabriel, wisdom is manifested. However, even at that time, the operation of wisdom was not necessary. 
The operation of wisdom was not necessary because heaven in itself is a perpetual continuum. If you store up in heaven, you have capacity to know. Yes, because heaven is a realm of life. It's a realm of knowledge. It's a realm of understanding. The moment you are set in heaven, there are nature's given to you. So anything that is going to be hid in heaven will be hid in mystery. Because heaven is a realm of knowledge. The only things you cannot know in heaven are the things that are locked in mystery. Gabriel was the submission of the operation of the wisdom of God. But wisdom was not necessary. The only thing that was necessary at the time was the operations of worship. You see, in worship, what happens is that in worship, the greatest revelation of God is manifested in worship. That's why worship is very significant. You see, the highest revelation of God is not God. The highest revelation of God is His holiness. See, the holiness of God is a revelation of the fact that God is in His own class. He is different from every other thing. Nothing is like Him. Every other thing derives from Him. He is separated. It is in holiness that the demarcation between creation and creator is manifested. So if you see the love of God, the love of God is a revelation of His holiness. It is in the love of God that you see that God loves differently from every other kind. It is in the love of God that you can know that nothing can love like God. So love in itself is a revelation of holiness. If you see the mercy of God, it's also another dimension of the unconditional capacity of God and to accommodate. That mercy of God in itself is a manifestation of His holiness. If you see the kindness of God, it's a manifestation of His holiness. But the only way you can submit the totality of the manifest revelation of God is on the altar of worship. Because in worship, creation gives way. So that God is predestined as king. That is why the only assignment that was needed in heaven was the assignment of worship. Till today, the elders don't do anything in heaven. The Bible said they fought peace morning and evening, day and night. They sing holy. Holy is the Lord. The angels don't call him love. They don't call him kindness. They don't call him peace. They call him holy. Because when you call God holy, you have called him love. When you call God holy, you have called him peace. When you call God holy, you have called him kindness. At that time, the only ministry that was required in heaven was the ministry of Lucifer. Because Lucifer was the ranking angel that was in charge of worship. And because of this, Lucifer felt that he was special. He did not know that everything that he is and was, was a revelation of the side of God. Nobody can contain God completely. As big and mighty as he was, he was only a revelation of a kind of God. He didn't know that like him were other 12 princes. There were 12 chief princes in heaven that had the same status as he had. But because his ministry was relevant at the time, he felt that he was more significant. And pride entered his heart. And Lucifer declared, so that we are sent to heaven. You know, Lucifer was so big that even the Ephraim at that time, before man came, was committed to him. Yes. If you study the book of Isaiah, chapter 14, verse 16, you hear what the Bible said. He said, Thou that shake the head. He was operating as the prince over the Ephraim. And he was also operating the mountain of God. And suddenly, Lucifer thought in his heart that he was like God. He said that we are sent to heaven. We exalt my throne above the stars of God. And we are sent above the clouds. When you speak of the clouds, you are speaking of the glory. You see, God sits above the glory. He wants to ascend above it. He said that we are sent above the stars of God. And I will sit in the sights of the north like the most high. He didn't need to say it. The moment he altered it, God picked it from his heart. Immediately, he was no longer relevant. The meaning of God was evoked. <laughs> you see, when you are walking with God, you think, I hear people say, God cannot do anything with us, without us. <laughs> they don't know what sovereignty is. They don't know it. The whole of heaven depended on Lucifer. You see, the kind of worship that Lucifer organized in heaven is not this type. The Bible said, Thy God. Thy, uh, thy pipes and thy tablets were indeed from the day of thy creation. Lucifer was so wired that he could read the emotions of God. He could read the movements of God. So when God wants to be happy, Lucifer just needs to shake. And then joy will fill the temple. If God wants to laugh, Lucifer just needs to shake. And the heaven will be filled with laughter. He knew God more than every other person. Because by reason of his service, he was connected to God intimately. But suddenly... The moment he decided to go against the legal system of heaven, he was no longer relevant. It was the first time that Lucifer understood 
that God does not depend on anything. That is the name I am. That I am. It doesn't depend on anything. I am was invoked in heaven. The Bible said, Oh, Lucifer, thou son of the morning. He said, How art thou falling? He said, Thou shalt be cast from the mountains of the Lord. You are cast away. He said, There is no place for you anymore. Ah, how can heaven survive without Lucifer? Heaven survives because there is the I am. The I am does not need you. You need him. Lucifer did not have this understanding. So he decided to defy the protocol of heaven. And he was cast from the mountains of God. It was when Lucifer was ejected from heaven that man became leader. You see, heaven is a realm of perpetual continuum. There's no time. It's a timeless reality. The years that Lucifer lived in heaven, we cannot tell. But let me tell you something. Before the first earth was created, Lucifer was there. When, this, when the first earth was created, Lucifer was there. You see, the earth, what you read in the book of Genesis chapter 1, was not the creation of heaven and earth. It was a recreation process. The Bible only mentioned it in verse 1. Everything that happened from verse 2 was recreation. It was not creation. But when Job decided to go against the holiness of God, and God showed up, he said, where were you when the sons of the morning sank into the foundations of the earth? See, the reason everything has sunk, do you know the honor that Lucifer had with God? Lucifer was given the honor to be the custodian of life. You see, life is coded in sound. Life is not coded in breath. It is coded in sound. And Lucifer was in charge in the harmonics of sound. So Lucifer was the regulator of life. That is why God speaks to the dead. God can speak to this ion because this ion can produce sound. Anything that has sound has life. So when God was creating the world, he said, where were you? He was talking to Job. You know, a lot of us, sometimes we try to carry out treasonable offenses. But when God shows up, you discover your holy. Job thought that because he was carrying the sacrifice, obeying the covenant, nothing should happen to him. He didn't understand that his life was actually designed by God to mirror a dimension of God. See, every circumstance you are going through, it was written before the world began. Those circumstances are the vistas through which people will know who God is. When you go through sickness and you are healed, people will now know that there is an invincible force that heals. So through you now, they understand that healing is real. The sickness is not a challenge. God allows it so that you, through your circumstances, can become a vista through which people will know who God is. He did not put the sickness on you, but he turns it out for good. That's why he says, all things work together for the good of them that love him, who are called. It's a calling unto purpose. Job was being bedeviled by sickness. And instead of Job giving thanks that he is found worthy to mirror the faithfulness of God, Job began to rebel. And God showed up. He said, who, who is this that speaketh war, darkened counsel by wars without knowledge? He said, where were you when I put in the foundations of the world? The things that are going on in your life now, they were written before the world began. Who told you you can change it? Your life is supposed to be a window through which people will see that God is faithful. That one should not give up with God. No matter how bad it is, the faithfulness of God speaks again. How dare you darken that which was obtained before the world began? That's why your circumstance becomes an altar of worship. But you don't know. You run away every time. God gives you a privilege to become that which with his dimension will be mirrored. And you run away. You are not wise. Lucifer had all of these honors in heaven and pride that is happening. The moment Lucifer fell, another operation began. That was when creation became necessary for man. You see, man was hid in the archive. You see, it's not like we were not in existence. We were actually existing, but we were hid inside of God. Ah. You didn't begin the day you were born. Tell somebody, you didn't begin the day you were born. You were hid in God. See, you were hid. God had man before the world began. Because one of the attendant revelation of God is that he is the omniscient one. He knows the end from the beginning. He's called Alpha and Omega. It means beginning, end. He journeyed into the end before the beginning began. So he knew that when Lucifer fails, the 
there was a need for another project because what God wants to achieve will always come to pass. And God must be worshipped so long as creation we find expression. The reason for creation is so that God is worshipped. So God created man and hid man in himself. Lucifer did not know that even when he was operational, a substitute was already in heaven. So when God began the creation of man, the Bible said, God said, let us make man in our own image. And he said, after the light, after our own likeness. And he said, in the image of God, he created man. The word created is the word bara. Bara means to be made out of nothing. So man came from the breath of God. When Lucifer fell, what God did was that he breathed man out of himself. And for that man to operate on earth, he need to encase him in dust. Why did God choose dust this time around? Because he does not want man to go the path of Lucifer. Now, the reason Lucifer became proud was because the very making of Lucifer was made with beauty and glory. If you read the book of Ezekiel chapter 28 from verse 11, the Bible said, Thou that seated the sun. When Lucifer shows up, his brightness is more than the sun. If Lucifer stands here now, you will no longer see the sun. He is that bright. The Bible speaks that Lucifer was made of the ten precious stones. Diamond, Jasper, Carbuncle, Gold, Sapphire. All the most precious stones that God ever created. That was what he gathered together to form Lucifer. And Lucifer was the definition of beauty and glory. But this time around, God did not want the glory of his creation to be external. He hid the glory inside. So the glory, who is God himself, he put it in dust. So when you look at a man, you can't see the glory until that which is on his inside comes out. That is when you see glory. In worship, what we do is that God decides to alter our orientation so that glory can come out. Worship is not an act. Falling down is not the act. Crying is not the act. The act is what God put in place so that as you shift away, the mortality can shift so that the glory can rise. Every time we worship, what happens in the spirit is that there is an ascension of glory from our inside. That is what Lucifer did not have. Lucifer's beauty was external. So if you look at him, you could call judge him. I can't call, I can't tell the end of T because I don't know T. If T did manifest, he's bigger than this country. That's how it is. So he said, God has given the treasure in 18 verses so that the excellency of the glory will be of God, not of man. When you see man operating now, you won't make the mistake to ascribe it to him. You will know that, no, what is happening is something inside. The technology that is operational here is beyond what I'm seeing. It's something inside. When you see Lucifer operating, you can give him the glory. But you can never give the glory to man. Because the glory is in empty vessel. What you see has no value. But what is coming out, you must ascribe it to God. That was the wisdom that encased the, 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 the creation of man. Man was created for a purpose. You know, I told you redemption was not necessary. Redemption became necessary because man fell again. The reason redemption became necessary was because man fell. So if, you're, if, you're, if all you know about the gospel is what God has done for you, then you don't know the reason why you were made. That's why you see people doing all kinds of things on the street today. They don't know why they were made. In the book of Genesis chapter 2, from verse 15, the Bible said, And God created, planted a garden in the east side of Eden. And he put the man there. He said he put the man there to cultivate it and to keep it. The word cultivate or nurture is a prophetic word. The word keep is also a prophetic word. There are two spheres of assignment. The first assignment is God word. The second assignment is earth word. The God word assignment is a an intercessory assignment, a prophetic assignment. That means man to cultivate that garden must always keep the garden synchronized with God. Because it is the pouring, the outpouring of God upon the garden that we keep the garden. So the first assignment of man is to hook up to God in fellowship. And so long as the man is hooked up to God in fellowship, creation will be preserved. The second assignment was for the man to extend the influence of God that comes upon the creation and dominate the world so that the garden will no longer be on the east side of Eden but a point will come where the whole earth will become the garden of the Lord. That's why our assignment is for the fellowshipping or hooking up with the Lord and then for the domination of the world. It is when the extent to which you carry out that assignment that will determine where you will sit in the banquet. That's what you were not taught. This gospel you have been taught, if you walk with it, you will go to heaven.
heaven and discover you are a nobody. Where you will be is what? A function of the degree to which you carry out your assignment in keeping and cultivating the garden. Are we together? However, man fell. But thank God. You see, David was carried in the spirit. And then he heard a deliberation in the angelic realm. You see, when he heard that deliberation, he himself now sat down and he began to contemplate. You see, the deliberation in the angelic realm was that the angels were wondering, why does God love man so much? Why? They didn't understand. Why does God love this man so much? The angels, they kept deliberating, they kept deliberating. So David, when he picked it by, prophet, by prophetic name, he himself now went for the first time and sat down. And he began to look at the stars. He looked at the heavenly bodies. He looked at the world. And he asked himself, he said, what is man that thou art mindful of him? He said, what is man that thou visitest him? He said, you made him a little lower than, the word there is not angel. The word there is Elohim. He said, you made, you see, the people who were translating the Bible, they felt that God, how can man be lower than only God? They are the angels, not bigger than man. So they were the ones that put angel there. If you go and check the Hebrew word, it's Elohim. See, in the operational structure of creation, man is next to God. That's the Adamic authority. He said, you made it a little lower than the Elohim. Why? Why? Somebody said, why? It's because of service. You see, the angels, according to their design, they can't know God. They cannot what? They cannot know God. They know, they only know about God. The only creation that has the capacity to know God is man. You know why? The only way God can be known is by the Spirit. And man is the only one that carries the Holy Spirit. So the Bible said in Ephesians chapter 3 verse 10 that the angels are watching the church to teach them the manifold wisdom of God. So every time the angels see God show love to man, they will just lie down and say, Holy. We don't know why, but you are, you are, you are sovereign. Holy. The same offense that Lucifer carried out, man carried out the same offense. And God now chose to become like a creation and save man. When they look at it, they lie down. They say, holy. You see, you go and sin, and then you come back, and you say, Lord, I'm sorry. And the next thing, God embraces you. Ah, they lie down. They say, holy. You see, when Jesus was telling the prodigal son, see, the, the, the parables that Jesus told were heavenly mysteries. A child deserted the father, squandered the father's resources. And the moment the father saw the child, the father didn't wait for the child to apologize. He ran and hugged him. Ah, the angels say holy. So it is what we say about God that they hear and learn. So it is man that says God is light. It is man that says God is love. It's man that says God is kind. It's man that says God is useful. It's man that says God is peace. It's man that begins to describe God to the angels. So one of the duties of the church is to teach the angels about God. It is the highest honor in the kingdom. But the more of God you will know, it is the more of Him that you interact with. Because God is known by His Spirit. That's why you can quote the whole scripture, but you don't know God. It's an experiential reality. The Greek word for it is epignosis. See, when you know about God, it's called gnosis in scripture. Gnosis is knowledge you come about by gathering data analysis. But as you begin to walk with the Lord, you begin to have disclosures. It's called epignosis. God begins to open itself to you. And then as you begin to mingle with God, you travel from epignosis to gnosko. In gnosko, what God is, you now are. So you, you don't just know it anymore. You have become a manifestation of it. The more you become it, when people see you, they see God. 
that is how you begin to colonize your world. Because the reason God designed it like that is so that you can preserve his creation. Creation has no preservation except as man arises. That's why the Bible said the earnest expectation of creation waited for the manifestation of the sons of God. The reason God allows you to come into him is so that he can derive pleasure through that interaction with you and so that through you he can provide and defend the integrity of creation. That is what we call the kingdom. In the kingdom, you become the functionary that stands for God. And the only way you can do that is to put away your appetite. Is to put away your desires. So that through you, God is manifested. The question is, how many of us are manifesting God today? You know, you don't know what Jesus had to go through for you to become who you are. The Bible said the prophets of old, he said they searched the scriptures diligently to find out when these things will come to pass. And he said even the angels, they desire to look. They try to peep. When they were talking about redemption, you see, the angels try to peep. Go and read First Peter chapter 1 verse 9. See, creation is the biggest, redemption is the biggest news in creation. When the angels heard about it, that God wanted to save man, the Bible said they peep. They try to peep into what God was trying to do. And he said, Jesus endured the shame for the glory that will be revealed. Do you know who that glory is? It's you and I. The reason Jesus endured the shame was for you and I. We are the revelation of the glory of God. See, the glory of God is no, just, no longer a cloud. It's not just a cloud anymore. The glory of God is man. And the reason for it is that Jesus paid the price to attain the claims of divine justice. For Jesus to do that, he had to relinquish the status of God and become a man. That's the doctrine of the incarnation. He did not stop there. He had to die the death of a criminal. Have you imagined what it would be like? Maybe they say, ah, they want to save the ant kingdom now. And they said, <laughs> they said, the apostle here should become an ant. <laughs> and go to change to save the ant kingdom. Do you know the plights that ants go through? So, he will now start, when reinforced now, he will be digging sand, so that he will live inside sand. Jesus suffered the highest shame. Then he died. Now, the significance of the death of Jesus, the significance of the incarnation and the death of Jesus, are enormous. Now, Without the incarnation, the claims of divine justice would not have been attained. Because a corrupt Lord cannot save another corrupt Lord. And even if you find a man that does not have corruption, he doesn't have the stature that is required to save the world. So the only way that was going to happen was for God to carry out the biggest sacrifice, which was to become man, so that he would become flesh and blood in order to save man. So Jesus became flesh and blood in order to save man. Now, because of that incarnation, you and I now have ability to participate in the spirit. Because, you know, somebody said the son of God became the son of, the son of men so that the sons of men can become the sons of God. It's very true. Yes, that is because, because Jesus partook of our nature. We are now called to participate in his nature. So he said, according as his divine power has made all things. What? According as his divine power has made all things. Help me with the scripture now. He said, look at me. First Peter chapter 1 verse 3. And he said, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. He said, he has given us these exceeding great and precious promises that by them we might escape the corruption that is in the world through love. So he gave us capacity to participate in divinity. That's why Jesus said, for somebody who is born again, he said, this is his new nature. We also enjoyed incarnation. But our own incarnation is from flesh to spirit. Jesus' incarnation is from spirit to flesh. But ours is from flesh to spirit. So Jesus said, like the wind bloweth, and that ministers us from whence it cometh or where it goeth. He says, so are they that are born by the Spirit of God. So you now, because of the corridor of incarnation, you can now become a spirit reality. You can now participate in the spirit. The death of Jesus, what it does for you is that he kills the old man. He judges the old creation. So the Bible said, because Jesus died and was buried, he said, you too, you are dead. It is that death of Jesus that makes you escape the penalty of sin. 
Because the law of the spirit is that the wages of sin is death. So you and I must have to die. But the only way we died was in Christ. So the death of Jesus gives you the pedestal and the opportunity for you to also enjoy death in Christ. So you have now escaped the messianic judgment. And it does not stop there. The power of sin is also broken from your life. Because you are no longer of the old stock. The old stock has been judged. It has died and it has been buried. But it doesn't stop there. Where does Christianity begin from? Christianity does not begin in the incarnation. It does not begin in the death. It begins in the resurrection. That's why Christianity is the victorious life. In the resurrection, what God does is that it infuses in you the seed of immortality. So every one of us has become a mortal entity. You know, sometimes when we are praying and then we begin to talk about the immortals, the immortals, all you imagine are angels. No. You are also an immortal. Yes. Do you not know that right now there are some saints, spirit of just men made perfect, who are operating in heaven like the cherubs of glory. When John went to heaven, it was not an angel that carried him around heaven. It was a man that ascended to glory. John wanted to worship him and he said, No, I am like unto you. I'm also of your brethren. I'm a brethren like you. We are also immortal. I read a book, The Maharishi of Mount Kailash. He was an Indian intercessor. The Spirit of God carried him into a cave, a far cave in Mumbai, India. And he has been there for 400 years. Death could no longer come upon him. Through intercession, he entered into immortality. Oftentimes, spirit of just men come to visit him. St. Francis of Assisi, they come to visit him in the tree. They interact with them. It is a, you know what Jesus said? There are some standing here who will not taste of death. You think that is a, an allegorical statement. You know, it's a literal statement. The man said he saw John the beloved. There is no record of the death of John. He was sentenced to the Isle of Patmos to die. But he didn't die. He, today he's alive. And if you think it's a lie, go and read the book of Luke, chapter 2, from verse 17. The Bible said, God told the prophet, he said, you will not taste of death until you see the consummation of Israel. The mortal body now has ability to keep immortality. In fact, during the rapture, what will happen is that the church will hit the revelation of immortality. You see, we have hit the revelation of healing. So healing is now commonplace. We have hit the revelation of prosperity. Prosperity is commonplace. A time will come. You know, First Timothy chapter 1 verse 10 says, God has revealed life and immortality through Jesus. A time will come when the church will know immortality and people will choose when they want to go to heaven. Yes. Yes. You can say me, I will be here for 120 years and then no devil can kill you because you have seen the revelation of immortality. Elijah did not die. He was carried to glory. Enoch did not die. He was carried to glory. Glory to God. So, that is the revelation of the resurrected Christ. That revelation gives you the ability to live above sin. And then you have the revelation of the ascension. Jesus had to ascend to heaven. The reason Jesus ascended was so that you and I can continue his ministry. You wouldn't have had the authority. See, every time this man of God is preaching, it's Jesus that is preaching. As I'm preaching now, it's the work of Jesus I'm doing. The prophets of old, they spoke about Jesus' coming. We are not speaking about Jesus. We are representing Jesus. That's the difference in the dispensation. The people of old were prophesying the coming. We are not talking about Jesus. See, when you go to speak to somebody about salvation, eternal life does not come from heaven. It comes out of your spirit. Because as he is, so are you now in this world. See, there are three questions of redemption. The first question is, who have believed our report? The second question is, unto whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? The third question is, who shall declare his generation? What we are doing is that we are declaring his generation. That's why we are bold to enter into territories of darkness. And we speak, because when we speak, the Bible said the Lord confirmed the words of his servant. He performed the counsel. And there is not all the time that we give prophetic words that we hear. Sometimes we don't hear, we decree it and it's established. That's how we take over territories. We come to territories and we judge the princes of the land. You come to a territory and you say, every soul in this land receives Jesus. 
People like John Knox stood up and said, Lord, give me Scotland or I die. And he caused a revival in Scotland. That's how we advance the kingdom. You come into your office, there are people there who are boasting of charm. There are people there, they say, no, this thing doesn't happen here. This, this is our culture here. What do you mean? You put an end to it because when you show up, Jesus has shown up. All of that authority you have is because of the ascension. That is why Jesus did not give gifts to men until he was ascended. He said, him that ascended. The same was the one that descended. And when he ascended, he gave gifts unto men. Some, he said, they will be apostles. The apostles are the ones that carry the mandate of the kingdom to different territories. So when an apostle shows up, it's not a title coming. It's a kingdom coming. It's a kingdom coming. When an apostle shows up, he plants a kingdom. He raised his people. And suddenly men begins to call upon the name of the Lord. He says, some will be prophets. This one has the capacity to tap into heaven. And they tell you, this is what God wants to do now. And because they alter it, it begins to happen. You could be going through crisis for 10 years. And then the prophet shows up and he says, Say, knee, knee, knee. It's not a big word, but because he has uttered it, what he has done is that he has connected you to heaven. And the success of heaven begins to power you. That was how Moses operated. Jacob was one of the patriarchs of old. Jacob cursed Reuben. But when Moses showed up by the prophetic oil, Moses said, Let Reuben leave. Let Reuben leave. Let Reuben leave. They say, Your family, ladies, don't get married. Ah. They have failed. They came late. You show up and you say, everyone is getting married. I did not have this understanding. My elder sister, one was 34, two were 32. And I showed up. I said, get married before this year run out. Three of them are married with children. The moment light hits you, you enter into authority. In the ascension, what happens in the ascension is that you begin to live on earth from heaven. The reason Jesus had authority on earth was because the Bible said, the son of man, which is in heaven, he was walking on earth, but he was living from heaven. And the Bible said, he that is from above is above all. The ascension gives you opportunity to live from heaven. So every time you speak, you are speaking from heaven. Every time you move, heaven is moving. There are times when we come to places, people are demonized. As you look upon them, the demon leave. The demon leave. You don't need to command them. You now have understanding of the ascension. When you show up, heaven goes. I came with an entourage of angels. There are some meetings that I attend, and as I just mount the altar, I see an angel right through the people, and then the power of God begins to move. I don't even say anything. They don't know me for God's sake. I just came there for the first time. That is because of the ascension. The ascension gives you authority, authority with God, authority to shape the lives of people. I've come to places where people are immoral. I rebuke, I say, I judge the spirit of iniquity. And they have a turnaround. I learned it from John G. Lake. John G. Lake will see somebody who is alcoholic, giving to addiction, and he places his hand on the person, and he breaks the siege of addiction. He doesn't need counseling. He dies. That's the power of ascension. The enthronement is what orchestrates the supply of the spirit. It's because of the enthronement that we have the Holy Ghost. So every time that you want more of the supply of the spirit to interact with the king, the more you see him as Lord, the more the spirit is supplied. That's what I was teaching yesterday. In obedience, what we do is that we proclaim Jesus as Lord. And the more you proclaim him as Lord, the more the spirit is supplied. So sometimes you just come and you say to people, you are blessed. They don't know why their life changed. Sometimes you are traveling in a motor car because you sat with a man, a cost is broken. The guy will, not, will never even know that you broke the cost. He doesn't know because it's the supply of the spirit. You come to a place and then you just shake hands with people. That you shook hands with them, their lives change. We've had those testimonies once and again. Sometimes God wants you to know because God wants to register the consciousness. He allows something supernatural to happen so that you will consciously transmit. You know, transmission is a conscious thing. You transmit consciously. A time came when we went to pray for a woman that was crippled. Pray down the power of God. She got up and began to walk and seven demons left her. In fact, before she walked, the woman that was praying and broken was moving on her, her knees like a dog and back. Energy. The demon left her. She began to walk. When we came out from there, me and the pastors that went were just falling and then we just came to the house. And then as I was shaking people, they were falling down. That was the first time I saw the dimension. I didn't know what was happening. They were, they, they passed us, they were shaking. I just, sister, where do? And then people were calling them. I said, I now stop shaking people. And the Holy Ghost whispered, 
you say, I want you to know that you are a carrier of the blessing. You are a carrier of the blessing. So now when I touch people, I do it consciously. Because I now know that I am a carrier of the blessing. The blessing travels in the spirit. So if you want to dominate your world, what you need to do is that become more interwoven with the spirit. The more you engage in intimacy with the Holy Ghost, the more he breaks out. That's how you change your world. The gospel of the kingdom is the unveiling of Jesus as the Lord. Lord in your life, Lord in your system where you belong. That is the gospel that we are called men to preach. That gospel requires responsibility. Because everything Jesus did was in your spirit. It's a legal thing. For you to make it a, an experiential reality, you must take up responsibility. Because what Jesus did did not happen in your soul. It did not happen in your body. If your soul is born again, you become an imbecile. Because there will be no information there anymore. So God did not born again your soul. It was your spirit that was born again. And everything God has, he put it in your spirit by the Holy Ghost. So the Bible said, he that is joined with the Lord is one spirit. But what God wants to achieve is that that reality that is in your spirit will permeate your soul permeate your body and permeate your circumstance. For that to happen, you need time to fast. You need time to fellowship. You need time to pray. That's where responsibility comes into the gospel. Because you were not, you were not saved by works, but you were saved unto good works. It is in your good work that you advance the kingdom. Some people say, come on, I don't need to fast. Why do I need to fast? If you don't need to fast, you will have God in your spirit, but they will not, they will not manifest in your soul. Because your soul is full of sin and iniquity. The word of God needs to enter your soul again and again. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18, it said, We all with unveiled faces, beholding us in a glass, the image of the Lord, we are changed. The word is metamorphosis. Your soul is restored. A point comes where you can feel when the power of God seeps through your soul. You can feel it on your body. Because your body is mortified. See, those desires, they die. The Spirit of God mortifies them. But for it to happen, you must constantly engage the spirit realm. What do we do in prayers? In prayers, what we do is that we collide with God. And we allow Him to penetrate us. That's why it's, it's conversation. As you talk with Him, you pour yourself to Him. And then the point comes, you listen, He pours Himself to you. So what happens is that, the soul we did not have this experience of salvation, we now begin to have it. We now begin to have it. So suddenly you go to the place of prayer and you come out strong. You don't see any limitation again. If you leave that intensity go down, the things you were confronted yesterday, you will see them today and run. Because that's the state of the soul. The soul needs constant reinvigoration by the Spirit of God. That's why we pray. He say, you dearly beloved, building up yourself upon your most holy faith. Praying in the Holy Ghost. As you pray in the Holy Ghost, the point comes when you hit the zenith of your faith. And then that time, God begins to talk to you. How about Boko? How about Dubai? How about Mozambique? Then at that point, you now begin to speak over nations. You must first of all rise before you can raise men. Prayer helps you to rise. Rise up in God. Then a point comes where you come to your family and then you speak words. That's when the Bible says, Savior shall arise from Mount Zion. See, everything around you will be there until you take the responsibility of the kingdom. And if you don't take that responsibility, what will happen is that you will not just lose out in God, but a day will come in eternity. God will point to you that this one, the one who was supposed to save you, for that day when you saw him, I asked you to talk to him, you refused. So for that, you won't have this problem. This one, you were the one who was supposed to deliver her. But I told you three days ahead to fast so that you will have faith to confront that demon. But you refused. So this lady was tormented for ten more years. Those ten years that she missed, it was your fault. Do you know the Bible said to Ezekiel? He said, if I tell a wicked man, you will die. And you do not tell him, I will demand his blood of your hand. We are called on to priestly responsibilities. These things must dominate you until life itself does not have meaning anymore. Paul said, if it's for him, he wants to go to heaven now. He said, the reason is because of you. It's for your own benefit. Have you come to a point where you are living because of what God wants you to do? Or you are just living because you love life? Love life. Lord, keep me, keep me. It's a time for people to arise. 
You are not standing up in the night to pray because you have a problem. You are standing up in the night to pray because you want to stop the operations of witches and wizards. That time that you raise those insects, it blocks things in the spirit. You are rising up in the night to pray because that young man going to that dear parlor, a time has come for him to stop. You are rising up in the night to pray because that prostitute lady, you want her to enter into her destiny in God. That's when you begin to live the life of God. The life of God is the life of sacrifice. You live for others. You live for purpose. You live for ordination. The ordinations have been calling. It has been beckoning upon you. How long will this man of God be the only one facing this altar? When will you rise up and say, no, 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 no. There is something happening in Udi. Let's go there. When will you rise up and say, there is something happening in Usuka. Let's go there. It is time for you to become militant. It is a calling unto a militant spirit. The Bible said in the day of the Lord, he said, men shall arise by horses. He calls some of them war horses. He calls some of them race horses. He calls some of them show horses. Who are you in the spirit? Paul said, henceforth, we know no man after the flesh. It's time for you to put your beauty aside. You are not the only beautiful one. It's time for you to come out of your depression. You are not the only ugly person. It does not take beauty or ugliness to achieve it. It is a writing code that is being engrafted in your spirit. God knew you were going to do it. He had faith in you. Who told you you had the right to disbelieve yourself? The one that made you say you could do it. Who told you you cannot? It's a deception from the devil. Can you rise up in the spirit and ask the Lord for the strength that is required to bet your ordination? A lot of people are in bondage because you have not risen. How long will the bondage continue? And this expectation of creation waited for the manifestations of the sons of God. The Bible said you die like men, you fall like the princes because you know not. I come to tell you tonight that heaven had already prepared you. Before you came, it was written. You are just discovering it. It was written in the spirit. The devil knows that's why he has been fighting you. Because your star reveals it. Before Jesus was born, the devil had gone ahead to truncate the process so that he would not be born. After Jesus was born, the devil still went and truncated the process. The reason you have been fought intensely is because they know the day your destiny breaks out. Oh my God. A nation is in for a deliverance. Most of the people that you see doing mighty things for God, they were not even in the cities. They were far, hidden away from civilization. But when the light of God begins to shine, it begins to draw men. It begins to draw men. It begins to draw men. Maybe you started the prayer as one man. Tomorrow a friend walks in and sees you praying and he wants to join you. Tomorrow he brings his friend. Next tomorrow you are 50. Next tomorrow you are 100. And next time you are looking for a place where you will pray. Next time you are beginning to send men. You are beginning to send men. And then they begin to wonder, is this not Chinenye? Is this not Tonyenye? Is this not charity? No, 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 no. The one you are seeing now is a God. God has risen on his inside. God has risen on his inside. Hey! How oh, I wish we could allow God. The Bible said Jesus stands on the door. Knocking on the heart of men. Will you look away from yourself for one more time? How long will you look at your limitations? Moses was a stammerer. Yet God sent him to deliver a nation. Can you look away? God knows you cannot pray, yet he calls you a prophet. He knows you cannot fast, yet he calls you an apostle. God knows you are poor, yet he calls you a governor. When will you receive the prophetic word over your life? Ah, the word of God is so holy. Sometimes when you don't have the energy, what God does is that he allows a man to of another man to come upon you. The Bible said in the book of Songs of Solomon, chapter 4, verse 4, it says on the mountain of the Lord, there are shoots, shoots of a thousand warriors. Even if you cannot achieve it, a mantle can rest upon you. It's time to drink of another waters. It's time to drink of another waters. It's time to drink of another waters. So brasa pateke boa. Reteka borebo sapatenas. 
rapa pare de bombo to para baba baba alege bombo sobra oh ale oh ale 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 Samale mara na ina se ba ela to male ka ba ba e Ah saya ta baria pa wa ile ku atamaya po ile ku atarapa se bo ata e wa parabana e akakapola kapapa 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 indo so ka se ba bara ta bo 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 kate man to to bo bo koria ta eria ta eria ta eria ta man ta para ka bo la para ta
especially when you are on bike, scriptures begin to open, scriptures begin to open. But you don't have a habit of documenting. The Lord says He's raising you a prophetic teacher. I want to use I want to use you now to impact the people so that the grace that has come upon one may come upon all because he sent his word to Jacob and he lightened upon Israel. Lift your hands toward heaven. Lift your hands. What God was trying to achieve was to open you into a dimension. A dimension when angels put through scriptures. You have been receiving whispers, but from now, you are not just going to hear, but you begin to see the angels that come to teach you. Holy Spirit, pay attention in the congregation. As the fire rests on them, it will touch people there. Lord Jesus, after the count of three, one, two, three, take it. Take it. Take it. Let it descend. Let it be stronger. 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 There's an equipping going on. There's an equipping, an equipping going on right now. I can see a young lady. Listen. Oh my Jesus. Oh my Jesus. Listen, listen. There's a young lady here now. Listen. There's a young lady here. The healing oil has been in your hands since you were a child. Pay attention. The healing oil has been in your hands since you were a child. When you pray for the sick, you find yourself crying, crying. Now, this is what the Lord is saying. When you pray for the sick, you find yourself crying. And then most times when you pray or worship God, sometimes it's as if you hear sounds and you are even afraid. You feel afraid sometimes because of the presence that comes. The Lord wants to activate you into the office of the court this morning. Where is that lady tonight? This morning. Where is that lady? You are the one. Oh, oh my Jesus. Rapateboroboros. Serapate ke bonde se prata. Riska frala skiro para bande. Meres ka prata kiros. Rete perendo se patelia. Mante kibo rata pas. Rapatare bonde sapate. Mente se pe kibo para gadas. See there is an equipping going on in the spirit. Refuse to be distracted. Pray in the Holy Ghost. Focus on Jesus. Your home. 
see, the Lord has come to judge and set some altars. I see your elder brother moving from one place to the other. In fact, you have considered they have considered it to be a waste. The Lord has come to judge ancestral altars that make vagabond out of men. Where is this lady? Aya. Aya Matera. Another lady here, you are praying for your mom. Your mom, your mom has an issue with her organ, kidney or something. Your mother said, Your mom has a challenge. You have been praying for wellness because your mom seems to be the breadwinner of the home. But she has been struck by a fixed one. Come out, come out, come out quickly. Let me minister to the both of you. The Lord began to give me words. But I didn't want to interrupt the ministration. The Lord told me there's a young lady here that predominantly you receive songs from God. You receive songs from God, but you've lost them. You've lost the songs. In fact, the songs the Lord has given you, 
If those songs will have to be sung by now, you would have gone far in life. He said, but demons come and steal them from you. The Lord wants to place something on you this morning. That's the day they come. You see, sometimes when men of God speak these things, it's because God is out to ordain. I see you writing many songs, many songs, but you have lost them. Demons come to steal them from you. And most of your songs are supposed to be songs for deliverance. They are deliverance songs. Songs that pierce through the soul. But you've lost them. Demons stole them from you. The covenant keeping God. The covenant keeping God. The covenant keeping God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we speak in tongues for just five seconds? I'm losing. I'm losing a vision. Can you speak in tongues for a few seconds? I'm losing. A vision just flew past me. And I'm losing it. Hallelujah. 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 I'll just try to describe. I'll try to I'll try to describe what I've seen. We need to save a woman. Right? I'll try to describe what I've seen. If this was just it flew past and I couldn't really lay hold on it very well. I've seen a family. Family of about two persons thereabouts. The father of the home was cut off. And since then, the woman has been in depression. In fact, right now she's having a problem around her chest, like a heart issue. And um, I think the person represented here is a lady or something. I can't, can't get the details very well. She's having an issue like a heart. And every, 
every child of the house is now so concerned that it has become the reason why you cannot leave home. Cannot leave home. I don't know if I got this description clearly, but if you are in that category, can you come? The family. The woman now, there's a, there's a tap on her chest. Sometimes it's as if she's losing her breath. Losing her breath. Demons have come to truncate. Demons have come to truncate. Can you stretch your hands over them? And release the judgment of God against the root of that thing. So Kaprahito Eka Pasudo Poraskamas Bahito Zuban de Legizos Yes, I will lay hands on them, and that report will be brought away. He has some authority over this realm. Shapata Kitos. Many angelic simulations. As if before you see what's happening, God, before you see what's happening, God, maybe that's why the visions are diffusing so fast. I'll just try to describe. You know, sometimes when you see these things, you need the spirit of wisdom to tell you what the interpretation. They're just floating. I just perceive in my spirit. Listen. Say sometimes when you are operating in the spirit, you need to know when God spoke and when you pick. Alright? I just perceived in my spirit that there is somebody here. Your auntie has been married for five, getting to six years now. But there have been no issue. 
And it has become a source of concern. I just perceived in my spirit. You see, a lot of things are happening. A lot of things are happening. Get the time frame that was witness to my spirit. I just perceived in my spirit. Is there anybody here like that? See the, see the time that I gave. I don't, I don't, I'm not saying 10 years, 15. I said for 5 to 6 years. That's the witness that came to my spirit. Alright? If your auntie is looking for a child, we can join faith with her. But the one being I perceive, the Bible said, the perception says for 5 to 6 years, there will be no issue and it has become a challenge. Join faith now for the Lord to visit. See the time frame I gave? Man of God, please. And you will decree over them. Let the church stretch forth our hands for this once. As we join faith with our brethren to pass declarations to open up the womb of men. Let's join faith and stretch forth our hands. The Lord will begin with them here as an indication of what He is doing. I see two of them that right now something is happening to you and it's happening to that relation of yours that we are talking about. Join faith. Come on. Oh, my Lord, I'm looking at one of them. You, you are fully aware that that relation of yours has gone into diabolical means. Diabolical means to see to it that the baby will come out. But I hear God say, children are the heritage of His Majesty. The fruit of the womb, this is the world. They will have mercy upon you because the oracles of God has declared it. He that performed the counsels of His ministers. How shall these things be? For the Spirit of the Most High will rest upon you. Suddenly that relation of yours will begin to feel lodgings in her spirit. Suddenly she will begin to find strong inclinations to serve the will of God. In fact, I see one of them will go and join departments in church. I'm seeing service. Through service, one of them, something will come out of her. Oh, hold your belly, all of you. Hold your belly, all of you. Hold your belly. Hold your belly. Your belly. Just hold it. Hold your womb. Hold your womb. Those of you that came out, hold your womb. Hold your breath. Oh, Jesus. 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 The mercy of God locates your relation. The mercy of God locates her wherever she is. I will form a baby in the womb. We create it. 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 According to the time of life, the cry of a baby will be heard in that family. And the better fault of that child will mark the end of the mockings of darkness for that family. And so shall it be. Oh, fellow Kopon, to skip what us out. Hallelujah. Is there anybody here that has complication with the left ear or something? Complication. Complication with the left ear. Yes. The Lord just told me. 
a complication with the left ear. Left ear. A young man. A young man. Complication with the left ear. How many of you? You have issues with hearing? Or there's pain, itches inside, some kind of complication. If you are healed, will you know? If you are healed now, will you know? Can you verify now that you are healed? All right, put your left hand there. Put your left hand there. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I rebuke that spirit of infirmity. That has plagued your ears, left ears. I command that plague to end now. I command the plague to end now. Healed in Jesus' name. 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 I command this ear be restored. Be restored. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Instantly, instantly be healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Healed in Jesus' name. Come out of our ear. 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 Come out in the name of Jesus. Out of her. Out. 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 Out in the name of Jesus. Get out of her in Jesus' name. Come out. I command the ear. Be restored. Open up. Restored. Open up. In the name of Jesus. Come out. Get them off. What are you doing? Come. Go to front. Before my ear normally pains me. How do you feel now? Okay, completely healed. Are you sure you are healed? Are you sure? And you are just watching like that? Show me. Give the Lord a hey. The Lord. The Lord. What was wrong with you? Silent place, you hear sound. Okay, go to a silent place and verify and come back. Any other person? Where were the people that were prayed for? Come up. How many persons? What was wrong with you? Not yet, blocks and open. How do you feel now? It's open now. Was it not for you? You feel an opening now and you feel you are healed. Thank you, Father. It's done. Which other person? How, what was wrong with you here? When I yawn, it's like my yawn. Each time you yawn, it gets locked. Yawn now. What happened? When you try to yawn, what happens? Say, when she tries to even yawn on her own, it happens. Go check. Okay, what? 
down, down. Do it and come. Let's get to know what's happening. To minister. Any other person? How many persons you were prayed for? You were prayed for. What was wrong with your ear? It teaches you as well. So when you're feeling the issue, when you came, come and go. But when you were prayed for, how did you Please enter your ear. Our ears were blocked. But while prayers were going on, please enter that ear. Who knows what the Holy Ghost is? If the wind doesn't work, and that affliction is cost forever. Cost forever. Cost forever. Cost forever. Cost forever. Cross forever, cross forever, cross forever. Get out of her, get out of her, get out of her, get out of her. Get out of her. It's cross forever. You are declared whole in Jesus' name. Let the ladies arrive. Lord, the Lord is doing something. See, I wanted to tell you that there were persons with inter- of internal organ challenges. That was the next ministration I would go to. But before I would, I would finish, God's servant saw angels descending to this place with body parts, with body. Those with internal organ, I've seen livers restore. Go back and carry out a liver functioning test. Go back and carry out. Where are the people that even have these challenges? Let's minister specifically. You will go back and carry out a liver functioning test and discover you are totally made whole. Can you lift your hands toward heaven? Oh Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Oh my soul, braso to paragapatekos. Lepres que vendo rapabidos cabrastas. Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus, I declare everyone under the sound of my voice, made whole in Jesus' name. Let there be healing of livers, healing of kidney, blood infections completely healed in the name of Jesus. I command every share in your body restored right now in the name of Jesus. Go ahead and shout glory to God and receive your healing. Give me a hot phrase, a hot phrase for five minutes. A hot phrase. What's the most violent phrase you have here? The choir people, what's the most violent, most violent phrase song you have here? For five, five minutes. Meanwhile, how do you feel? Is the sound still there? Touch! You are about to dance. 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 This song is not hot. You are good and your mercy is forever. You are good and your mercy is forever. You have to be a choir member now. You are good and Oh, <laughs> 
You know why I ask you to dance? You know why I ask you to dance? The Holy Ghost just told me. Listen. The Holy Ghost just told me to release upon you such that He has given me. Wait, let me tell you something. You don't know what I'm talking about. I have not, I have not entered one tenth of what's of my life. See, sometimes I pray for God to help me. This man standing in front of you, Benihim has imparted me. I was on, at passing on the torch in Rehan Bonke's meeting. I received an impartation from him. Bishop David Wedeko has imparted me. Reverend Chris Oyakilomi have ministered to me. Dr. Paul Enenche have anointed my head. See, you don't know what I'm telling you. Apostle, Apostle Arome Osai have laid hands on me over and over. When I tell, see, Apostle Randy Clark have laid hands, I knelt in his front, he laid hands on me and said, operate in the glory realm of the anointing. You don't even know Randy Clark. He's the one that wrote the forward in the school of the seers. But white, a street evangelist in the U.S., he, he gives people, he has laid, I knelt in, he laid hands on me. The oil of my life, I have not begun to operate in the world. But if that oil is imparted in you, you can see there is grace for overtaking the spirit. You can go ahead of me ten times and ma- maximize it. Are you with me? The spirit of God says, What he has put on me, I should release it on people. When you dance, you show gratitude and you connect to things. By the time I'm releasing it, it may be what Benihim put on me that will rest on you. Benihim is the most important minister in the world. He has worked with most ministers of the gospel than any other. I know what I'm telling you. It is time for something to fall upon the truth. You need to watch God until you forget yourself. Then something will drop when I release the word. <laughs> Sometimes we are wrong. You know, I felt when you are great one, you are shouting. The Lord says it will be a quiet atmosphere. Alright? So we will take it very gently. And as you begin to worship God, it will begin to seep into your spirit. Gradually. Don't try to act. Don't try to act. He said it will be a quiet atmosphere. I got it wrong. Alright? And we take a, a very slow worship song. <laughs> You may want to repent before the Lord. You may want to, you may wish to repent in your heart.
song on the keyboard. Just the keyboard. Can you play the song on just the keyboard? Very quietly, slowly. Just be quiet in your spirit. And allow the Lord sit through you now. Father, thank you for your people. Thank you because you've looked upon their hearts and you've seen the purity of purpose. Thank you because by an act of your sovereign power, you have decided to release a measure of your grace upon them. Just as you do, O oh God, of the spirit that was upon Moses and placed on them. By the permission of your servant, who is the set, of the set man over this commission, ask that your spirit be imparted upon them. I ask, O oh God, now, and let there be a performance. Thou that performeth the counsel of the Spirit. Thou that enacts the policies in the realms that governs the operations of the Spirit. Thou that walketh the dimensions of heaven. Thou that orchestrates and powers the dynamic operations of the Spirit. Thou that governs the wind. Thou that dictates the movements of life. I ask that there be a performance. The be release of your spirit of You see, it has begun now. It has begun. It has begun. Just look at Jesus in your heart. It's beyond falling down. Beyond falling down, my sisters. Beyond falling down, my brothers. I will say, when the spirit is put upon us from on high. Oh my God. It's time for the wilderness to turn into a fruitful field. Only so great and I say, Kalukrana Sate Murukame Atani, Lagabundu Peraski Brenatundri Karasina Hasta, Alagabundri Ligisura Frahas Velikidus, Rubundu Sapati Kibuku Varakatika Paras, Rama Sate Kapalamati, Unzundu Prutus and Predeginis, Rafa Valikizundu Salamat.
have prayed, you shut down. You leave it to God. You see, we don't come to a point where we tell ourselves the truth. That's why we are still embarking on all kinds of religion. So when it comes to a man who can impress with the people, he says, but God has been praised. He said, but God has been praised. What we make every activity you carry out in the body of Christ make sense. It is in one context. It is in one way that the Holy Ghost takes over a It is a point where you excuse your intelligence, your soul, your abilities. It is a point where you excuse your connections and everything you have. It is a point where you excuse all the chances of your party is fine. It is a point that you have to do. It is a point that you have to do. It is a point that you have to do. If you have not come to that point where your journey to the point of life, Because I know many in the world who don't even talk for you as I know my Jesus. Because I don't know how many people are slain in their own trust. Because when I am going to have an expectation, the light, all of a sudden, with manifestation, your heart is dead. That you are talking and people are talking. I was sharing with them in Zenia as well. I said we talk about the atmosphere so much that the atmosphere has even become more important than the Holy Spirit. Meanwhile, I saw Moses stood before three million people and they were turning in such a thing. And there was no atmosphere that suggested the move of the Spirit. But Moses would talk to her. Say go forward, and he struck what is wrong, wrong, and they see pattern. Miracles happening when the atmosphere does not even permit, because he knows he knows something you don't know. I saw Elijah stood before a king that threatened his very existence. Do you know what it means to stand before Buhari now? I'm telling you that unless by my word it will not rain because of your evil. And tell him that you can't journey out of this land because of your evil. And it doesn't happen until Buhari locates you. Do you know where Buhari found him? Ahab found him in Horeb, the mount of God. That was not in the city. A king, they will say, Somebody made a proclamation in Makodi and Buhari will journey for Abuja looking for you. It doesn't matter if you are in Jatoka. He will go there to find you because he knows the keys of heaven is in your hand. You say it shall not rain. There shall be no rain or dew except by my word. That is not utterance that is categorized as speech power. That is a man locking heaven by words. It's not deriving so much pleasure with oratorial dexterity. It's somebody talking and the elements of creation obey by power. We don't believe what we say. And that's because the protocol of alignment is not complete. I also discovered that it doesn't matter who lays hands on you. It will remain in your heart as a seed that will never manifest. You can pride yourself in talking it. And this one I'm telling you, I'm a, I, I'm, I am a first-hand example of it. It down on me is not about laying on of hands. You have to fan to flame. You have to align or see the seed begins to germinate because alignment brings you under the atmosphere of glory where the realities of God are given expression. If I tell you the people that have imparted me, you'll be amazed. If it's by impartation, I won't be here. 
I would have been touring the whole nations because Benin has impacted me one on one. Pastor Chris Yakilome have impacted me. Dr. Paul and Nature have anointed me. Bishop Oedeko have impacted me. Randy Clark have impacted me. Todd White have impacted me. It's not about impartation. It's the extent to which submit yourself for that which is putting you to grow. We have journeyed to places, slept on crusade ground to motivate our ego. We come back and tell people I've been here, I've been here. And at the end of the day, we even take the glory in mundane things. Because we want to tell people I also slept on the crusade ground so that you know our passion. You know our zeal for Jesus. And it ends there. When you come to understanding, you will know the things that matter. Your orientation will be in one direction. The Holy Ghost. You become most disadvantaged when you take pride in spiritual things. Because spiritual things are expected to, to remove everything that is self from you. So that everything that is God will be imparted. But we are blocked out of spiritual realities. What's about pride? I'm the man of prayer. I'm the fasting machine. <laughs> you say, holy men of God speak as they were carried. They understood it experientially. So it doesn't matter even if death was standing face to face. Can you ask me to help you tonight? Because we need help. I tell you the truth. We need help. We need help. We need help. We are a generation that need help. Death has never been seen as bogus the way it has seen in our generation. We need help. Try arrogance. When we have not seen anything, we have not even. And you ask Jesus to help you. We are so proud that we come for meeting and we decide what should happen. And as far as that thing doesn't happen, we don't ma- it doesn't matter what God is saying. We write it off. <laughs> we need help. Thank you, Father. Thank you, precious Jesus. In Jesus' name, we thank you. We thank you. We thank you, Father. Thank you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You may be seated. Let's look at scripture for a few minutes. For a few minutes. Me deeper, deeper in love with you. You can sit down, just allow your soul to be anointed. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper, deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I love you. To be deeper in love. Take me deeper. Deeper in love with you. Jesus, hold me close in your embrace. Take me deeper. Deeper than I've ever been before. I just want to love you more and more. How I love to be deeper in love. You see, God created the man. And he put the man in creation. And he said, let the man have dominion. Why does the man need dominion? Because part of the blessings that God gave to the man was for him to 
have authority and rulership over every other creation. Why then does this man still need dominion? I began to wonder. Then it dawned on me that the realities that were captured within the sphere of Eden were not found in the outer part of Eden. And God had every of us in mind when he began creation. And there was no way all of us could be in Eden. So the man, was, the man needed to expand all of the realities that were in Eden, the glories of Eden, to every other aspect or every other part of the earth realm. And he said, have dominion. Now, at this point, Satan was not yet in charge of the operation of the earth realm. The earth was not yet cracked. Man was not yet falling. A man needed authority, power, dominion in order to bet the things that God had in his heart. And then, as time progressed, the man decided to yield to Satan. And Satan came into the world and destroyed the protocol of creation and became the God of the system. Now, between that time and now, when does man need more dominion? When the earth was not yet falling, man was not yet falling, God said, have dominion. Between that time, comparing that time with now, that earth is already cracked. Earth is already under the authority of the devil. When do you think man needs more dominion? If you look upon this question, you will discover that there is nothing we need now as much as dominion. Because everything that is within the visible creation is fighting our existence. Everything. Including the mosquito itself. Compound that you swept and kept suddenly as begins to grow. Everything tries to choke out of it. So in order to succeed in this realm, I'm going to be very calm this evening so that I can leave you with some tangible points that you go home with to practice. I've discovered that we say a lot of things under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and people don't even understand. Thank you, you may be seated. God bless you. People don't even understand half of what we are saying. And most times because they are very, very inspiring and novel statements, their emotion is hijacked in the process. They are slain. They are shouting, screaming everywhere. But at the end of the day, when you check back after many months, there have not been any tangible change. So especially when I'm in the house, I decide to show a few principles so that we can practice. I'm also practicing them. The Bible says, iron, sharpened iron, as a man, the countenance of his friend. Apostle told us, he said, practice is superior to learning. And until you practice any, until you practice a reality, you don't know it. Because when you practice it, conviction is furnished. And when conviction is furnished, you can see manifestation. Are we together? So I'll be very calm to explain a few precepts. You see, man is in need of dominion. And redemption does not automatically give man dominion. Redemption restored man to the position he was falling from and gives him access to everything he had access to before he was falling. So after you are redeemed, it becomes your responsibility to take advantage of everything you have been given in God in order to exercise dominion. But the unfortunate thing is this. Before man was falling, he had access to the spirit realm. You see, the Bible said God told Adam to name all the animals. And the names that Adam gave to the animals were the names that were. So, even without consulting with God, Adam had right and access into the archives of the spirit to find out the things that were there before the foundations of the world. So, he picked from them and said the exact things God would have said if he was the one. 
That is because his soul was not falling. But the unfortunate thing now is that all we have for dominion, all we have for the exercise of dominion is locked up in the spirit. And your soul is now falling. And redemption did nothing about your soul. Just as it did nothing about your body. Everything redemption took care of was in your spirit. God now left you the resources to develop your soul and to plug into him. That is the summary of faith. Your ability to take advantage of the things that are provided for you to hijack the fallen soul to a level where it can operate at the frequency of the spirit. So you are different from Adam. Because Adam's soul had direct access to the spirit, your own soul is separated from the spirit. So there are a lot of integers you must put in place in order to take advantage of all that you have, which is now unfortunately locked up in the spirit. The scriptures give us a picture of what should be. So that by then, we will have a different kind of syllabus and a different kind of training to give us a new orientation as to what our reality should be. Because without the scriptures, it is possible for you to begin to judge yourself based on circumstantial manifestations. So the scriptures gives you understanding of the things that should be. And beyond that, it also gives you the strategies on how to take advantage of what you have with God to change existential realities to conform with what God has written concerning you. So every time you engage the spirit, it is a very conscious act with a targeted objective of recalibrating everything that is captured within the sphere of the fallen creation to align back with that which God wrote concerning you before the world was falling. And that is why your walk in the spirit is not a religious activity. It's not a soulish activity. It is a tangible reality you must apprehend in order to alter the negative protocol of oppressions that are around your life. But if you don't consciously engage these things, you may come to a point where you will do what others are doing and you will not have the results of the Bible. And you will keep consoling yourself and motivating yourself, thinking you are being humble before God, whereas that is not the plan of God for you. In fact, if you are not even sufficiently educated by the Holy Ghost through the scriptures, you may think where you are is the best of God for you. Meanwhile, you are far below what God expects of you. And a lot of persons may not see this until they show up in heaven. Then God begins to show them, well, this is the city and the city you were supposed to take over. These are the dead men you were supposed to raise. But since you couldn't, I now decided to send Reverend George. Because you couldn't summon enough it. <laughs> May God help me not to see that to him. <laughs> Hallelujah. Because the moment the creation was falling, the devil became the architect of creation. So what the circumstances reveal to you are contrary to your reality. What the institutions of the world reveal to you, they are contrary to your reality. You can just wake up the next thing you see hospitals everywhere. You see doctors walking very modestly with, with comportment, with gallantry. And then they tell you, yeah, they are the ones that handle sick people. Uh, hospitals are where they take sick people to. Yeah, cover yourself because mosquito will give you malaria. You, these things bombard you until, by the time you are growing up, it's natural for you to think that we are supposed to fall sick from time to time. And then suddenly you open the scripture and you say, let no one in Zion say I'm sick. Now the question is, is it that those in Zion should lie or try to refuse reality? Or is it that what they are saying in Zion it's just for talking sake. Because you can hear it and then pick it and begin to talk it. Because we think it's for talking. Meanwhile, the scripture is trying to give you another educational system of what should be. Because God is aware that every other thing around you will orient you negatively. And if you follow that kind of educational system, you will depart from your reality until a point comes where you are a direct opposite of everything that you should be. Hallelujah. They tell you, well, um, there are demons everywhere and uh, you see, our fathers, they did it like this. If you don't do it like this, you will die. And even if you don't die, it will affect your children. 
and your children's children. So even when the guy gives his heart to Christ, uh, when it comes to village things, he say, no, this thing we have to, you know, if you don't do it like this, there's a challenge. We have to do it like this. Because he has been educated by another syllabus. So the Holy Scriptures were given to reorient your mind. So that your journey in the Spirit can begin from there. But the unfortunate thing is that everything the Scriptures is revealing to you, you don't have it the way it is saying it. Until yourself is brought into the realm from where the Scriptures were crystallized. Because what the Scripture is showing you is a reality that is hooked up in another realm. So when you see it, there is supposed to be a hunger on your inside to journey into that realm where these realities are domesticated. So that when you apprehend it, you now have the authority to enact it on earth. And that's why the Bible said in Romans chapter 15 verse 4, it said the things that were written aforetime, it said they were written for our learning so that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. He said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10 verse 11, he said, what happened to them, happened to them as an example. And it is written for our exhortation. The word is admonition, but it is exhortizo. It is written for your exhortation. It is written to inspire you into that same reality. So it's written unto us for our admonition, unto whom the end of the world is come. So everything that was written and everything that happened to the people in the time of old is to reveal to you that these possibilities are available. So, it's not enough for you to begin to say the things they said by the Holy Spirit. You must have to find out how they said what they said. And you will do what they do to get into where they were to say what they said before you can have what they have. But the unfortunate thing, we take what they say, we run with it, we say it, and we don't have result. And because we don't know that we are actually being on the disadvantaged side, we think we are pleasing God by staying there in a humble fashion. So you see us begin to give negative interpretation to what alignment is. And some people now think alignment is suffering. God buffeting you until you are a nobody. Hallelujah. You can carry the whole scriptures and quote it. But these guys who were saying these things, they were saying it because they were carried into a place. And they spoke from there. So he said what happened to them was an example. So what you do as a student in the school of the spirit is to find out when these guys pray, how did they pray? And when they pray, what is their focus? What is their motivation? And when they are done praying, what is their result? So if prayer is what the Holy Ghost is furnishing in your heart, you check the scriptures to find out how the expedition of prayer was carried out. What was done in the time of prayer and the results that they apprehended after praying. So when you begin your own praying, your goal now becomes different. But because we are not sufficiently educated, when people pray, that is when you see the highest manifestation of carnality. Because it's possible for the brother who was in the prayer meeting and not praying to carry the mic and all of a sudden become, become a trumpet. It is possible for the brother... Who somebody else was praying and he sat down crossing his leg to carry the mic and be jumping up and down. So he doesn't understand that even while he was sitting, his objective was not different from when he was carrying the microphone. Because if he was not joining when he was sitting, he would not suddenly start joining when he's standing. His objectives are different. You see why we do a lot of activities but there are no results. Because we don't travel anywhere. A brother comes to tell you, yeah, he's going for a retreat. He's going for a retreat. It has everybody in the world. Meanwhile, there's no energy in his spirit for that retreat. That retreat, he went for his slept throughout and came back. Instead of asking God, help me, I need a retreat. He's going telling everybody I'm going for a retreat. Our orientations are distorted. If I know I have a retreat and then there's no body in my heart for retreat, I will begin to plead with the Lord, help me, help me. I need to pray now. I know something is coming. I know you are tearing prayer in my spirit, but there's no energy. That's what Apostle told us. He said, when they pray, they say, quicken us, oh God, that we might call upon your name. Because to them, praying is to hook up to God. So the brother is in the room, he prays, 
And then suddenly, every other person is on land. He is in cloud nine. So as he comes out from the place of prayer, his disposition changes. Everything about him changes. Because when he went to the place of prayer, he was in the realm of glory. Meanwhile, this man that prayed came out and nothing was altered in the earth realm. This man that prayed came out and nothing was changed around the circumstances he was interceding for. They didn't pray like that. How did they pray in the Bible? You will check it. And then you begin to practice. The moment these things become real to you, you will begin to notice steady progress with God. So when you come for a prayer meeting and they are praying, you will focus on Jesus. You will focus on the Holy Spirit. And then suddenly you begin to find grace apprehend you. People pray for six months, but they don't still tap into the grace of prayer. That means all the activities you were doing was in the flesh. Because if you press into God, a time comes when he lifts you up. If you press into God, a time comes when he begins to carry you from place to place. John said I was in the spirit on the last day. And then the first thing that happened is that he heard a voice. And as he turned, God brought him into another phase of his ordination. He began to see mysteries. And Jesus began to teach him mysteries. And he was at that level. Still focused. Walking with Jesus. And then another voice came. A door opened in heaven. He said, come up here. This time around he was not seen again. He was carried into it. He was moving from place to place in God. But we do our own. And then we move from place to place in man. When we come to a gathering like this, the Bible said, behold how beautiful and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in harmony. It's like, it's like the oil dripping from the head of Aaron down to, through his beard, onto his skirt. He said it's like the dew upon Mount Hermon. He said there, there the Lord commanded his blessings. If you know that a gathering like this is a place where the blessing of God is domiciled, ah, even your heart posture will change. You wonder why people will leave their house every day from Monday to Wednesday and they come to prayer meeting and that's when they are gisting. They come to prayer meeting. That's when they are sleeping. Then why not sleep at home? That you leave your house every day for two months and come to a place like this and nothing change, you should weep. What is happening? That means time has no value to you in the first place. You come to a prayer meeting for three months and nothing has shifted. The lost you were battling with, you are still battling with them. The weaknesses are still there and there is no proof that a layer of grace has been imparted onto you. And then you, ah, we, we are men of prayer. We are people of prayer. We are a community of prayer. You sing it everywhere. No, ah, we, 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 where we go is prayer. No, it's prayer. We prayer. We prayer. Become a trumpet of prayer. But what is the goal of prayer? What is the objective of the gathering? Do you even know it? Have you sensed it before? Have you touched the body? You see people praying as if they want to die. Sometimes I see people like Reverend George here. When they are done praying, their clothes is wet up to their trousers, And I say, Jesus, where did this energy come from? Oh, we will carry back here. The whole building is... I say, what kind of grace is this? He looks at me and say, I'm pastor. Sometimes I come, when they are going home, I will squeeze money, put in his hand and run away. I say, I connect, I connect. I, I can't imagine. How, how did he tap into such dimensions of prayer? And I was here before him. It's a conscious thing. It's a conscious thing. What you plug to you enter. We were in Lagos with Benihim. And he said, if a man enters into the realm, he said the realm comes out with him. <laughs> See, you don't, need, you don't need to act it. See, if you enter into the realm, it, the realm will attach itself to you. The Bible said, Moses wished not that his face shone like the sun. You see, Moses doesn't need to come and tell you, I've been praying for 40 days. He doesn't need to come out and make you feel as if, this prayer this time has affected him this prayer the body 
as he was coming, his face was glory. The things he was uttering is a proof that he ascended from the earth realm. It was that same mountain where Moses went to pray that he looked into the foundation of the world. He began to tell us things that happened when no man was on the face of the earth. He said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. How can a man talk like that? Where were you in the beginning? Where was God standing? He journeyed through the portals of prayer and he entered the place where no human being had been given access before him. By prayer. He said in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was void and without form. And darkness was on the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. A man giving a narrative of the things that happened when only the divine was present. By prayer. It was from that mountain that Moses descended from. And he said, let Reuben live. It doesn't matter. The man that caused Reuben was a patriarch. This is a man that speaks and heaven obeys it. I told them, Jacob placed his hand upon Manasseh and Ephraim. And he said, let the name of Israel be named upon you. Instantly, Manasseh and Ephraim became part of the 12 tribes of Israel. He didn't give birth. He said, let the name of Israel be named upon you. Heaven recognized it. If you study the movement of the tabernacle in the wilderness, Manasseh and Ephraim are part of the 12 tribes. And he looked at Reuben. He said, you stagger like the waters. He said, you are the excellency of my strength, the beginning of my strength, the excellency of wisdom. He said, but you wait upon my bed with my concubine, and for that you shall not prosper. And the cost that he placed upon him, when he was talking to Judah, he said, these things he's saying will last until Shiloh comes. But another man journeyed through the portal of prayer, and as he shut down, he said, let Reuben live. Let Reuben live. And it was established. It was Moses that descended from the mountain. He said, if you are on the Lord's side, come this way. The Levites came and he said, from today, these ones are no longer part of Israel. They have been separated unto the Lord. They became the tribe of God. By prayer. That was not part of his itinerary when he went to pray. It was not part of his objective. But when he journeyed in prayer, a point came where he could touch heaven from it. It was Moses that told God. He said, repent of these things. He said, how can the God of Israel do this kind of evil? He said, you want the Egyptians to now go and tell the nations that you deliver them from Egypt. This is a man giving counsel to God. How do men grow and become so mighty? The Bible said Moses went to the mountain. He fasted for 40 days, came back with the covenant. And then he broke it out of anger. He fell on his face and he was there for 40 days praying again. That's 80 days. Where he's praying, where he's going to, that's not where you are going. Because when he prays, he travels out of his body. You will die if you don't drink water for 40 days. Am I correct? Where are my doctors? You will die. And then he got up from there immediately and he went back to the mountain and stayed for another 40 days. It's not this prayer we are praying here and there. When somebody prays for 30 minutes and he has not taken a new prayer point. You know when the new prayer point comes, there is a way it helps you to recalibrate. <laughs> so when we pray, we look at time. We try to strengthen our we. Yeah, you know that time the Lord helped me. I prayed every day for 5 hours. For 3 months. Yeah, I'm hoping that by next month I will still... Yeah, let me journey. Let me journey. All his journey is in his soul. When he comes out, he has imagination that he is raising the dead. And then he walks like a man who is raising the dead. Moses was not like that. He said, I saw upon the mountain the Lord descending with 10,000 of his sin. He said, from Mount Paran. It was the same thing that Enoch said many generations before him. He journeyed to where Enoch stood and he saw what Enoch saw. If you journey in prayer, you will stand where Elijah stood. I heard Andrew Womack. In the place of prayer and meditation, he saw the battle between David and Goliath. I've heard strange things. People like Peter Tan wants to go for a meeting. He said he will see Jesus before he goes there. You know, Jesus appeared to Kenehagin seven times. That is a reality in his dispensation. A dispensation is coming where people will literally journey consciously into the spirit to find him because they have known the way. They have known the way. They know how to travel. Peter Tan wants to go for a meeting and he will consciously break into the spirit realm and see Jesus. He's still alive. By prayer. If you have the right information, you have the right motivation. 
If you have the right motivation, you have the right approach. If you have the right approach, you have the right results. Prayer. We trivialize hollow things. We trivialize things that have immortal essence and meaning. The reason God takes us through a tight corner sometimes is so that we come to a point where we are relieved of every other thing our confidence is hinged on. You know, sometimes you think you are praying until you come into a circumstance where there is no way out. For the first time, you will cry from your spirit. Then you will realize that every other thing you were doing was a show in the flesh. You come to that point where you throw your hand here, there's nothing to hold. You throw your hand here, nothing to hold. Then for the first time, if you speak in tongues, you will hear what tongue is. Because you will cry from your spirit. You have come to a point where if God doesn't answer, you are mad forever. What God has to teach you by alignment is to come to a point where every time you lift your voice in prayer, you will pray like that. That is the kind of life Jesus had. And he could stand in front of the tomb and he said, I thank you, Father, that you always hear me. There is no, there is no, there, it doesn't, it, 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 not, you are not trying to verify. I thank you, Father, that you always hear me. If there is no prayer, if you like, quote a thousand scriptures, nothing will happen. Because prayer takes you into the atmosphere of creation. The Bible said, the Spirit of God hovered upon the waters. There was chaos. God didn't start talking. He hovered. He enveloped the whole chaos into him until he submerged darkness in eternity. And then he caught forth light. There are principles of scriptures. But sometimes we are not well instructed. So we want to do it the way we feel we should do it or the way we feel like. These things are not done the way you feel like. They are done the way of scriptures. The way that has been prescribed. They are ancient landmarks. You don't move them. They don't shift. We pride in the wrong things. We do the best of things, but we don't have the results because we pride in the wrong things. Prayer is the first proof that a man has entered into the training of alignment. Because it comes to a point where only God is who he can call upon his name. If you are a man who your first alternative and many other alternatives are outside of prayer, then you have not entered the path of alignment. Jesus had many alternatives as the Son of God, many. But when he went to John the Baptist, he said, Suffer it to be so for now. He said, Thus it becometh of us to fulfill all righteousness. Apostles say, You are not called to be creative in these matters. It is written, you follow it. He said, And I come in the volume of the books. It is written of me to do thy will, O God. That's a man in alignment. Every day, the Bible says, early in the morning, Jesus went into the mountain to pray. And then the disciples will come and say, ah, the moment they come, they say, let's go. And then they go to town and he rebukes the blind. He rebukes the deaf. And things are happening. They think it's about rebuking. Hope you know, when you are a young Christian, you like to cast out demons. Get out! The day you say, get out, and you hear, power. <laughs> then you will know that no, no, no. This thing is not in the intensity of your command. It is a life that is transmitted in your utterance. You see, Jesus said, when I speak to you, I'm not talking to educate you. You may be educated in the process. He said, but the words I speak to you, they are spirit, they are life. Because the words come from the spirit. It comes from the spirit. He said, they are spirit, they are life. So when you journey in prayer, you have one destination, the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. When Jesus was done praying, the Bible said he went in the power of the Spirit. In the power. The Word of God is power. But what he came to do on earth was only going to be done by the Spirit. Because, okay, when school of nursing last week, an apostle told us, he said everything done outside of the Spirit is corruption. It has one destination, corruption. So Jesus knew that everything he must do must be by the Spirit. Even his death, the Bible said he gave up his, himself in the Holy Ghost. He died by the Spirit. He offered a blameless sacrifice by the Spirit. He spoke by the Spirit. 
In Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 2, when Luke was writing, he said he was writing to excellent Theophilus of all that Jesus both began to do and to say. And he said when he was about to be lifted, he gave commandment to the apostles through the Holy Ghost. Even the commandments he gave through the Holy Ghost. So if Jesus tells you, uh, brother, lock that door, he's telling you through the Holy Ghost. And that's why when you go to lock that door, you will find grace. Because he's not instructing you by understanding. He's instructing you by the Spirit. He said, Ogbe, go to Boko. He's speaking through the Spirit. So if you go to Boko, suddenly you will see a blind man and the eyes will open. And then you will run back and say, all, all the devils were casted out by our walls. He will laugh. Say, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. This thing I'm telling you, I spoke from a realm. I saw Satan fall like lightning. The reason you, you were casting out demons was because what I was telling you and the instruction I gave you, the commandment I gave you, I gave you through the Spirit. So the Spirit went with it. We know a lot of things. So we are separated from the realm. And that's why the focus, the goal, and the objective of everything we do is corruption. The most spiritual assignment, people do it in the flesh. But in those days, you can't even come to the apostolic community and lie. Because by the spirit you will die. A man wants to lead prayer. He goes and kneels down and prays first. So that he will be helped. You know, when you are trained in the spirit, he, he trains your soul. So your soul has the capacity to do it without the spirit. And he consciously trains your soul so that you will use your will to choose him. When you study the scripture, your mind will remember the scripture. But every time you go to minister, you pray for utterance. Even the sequence of revelation, you trust him for it. That is worship. That is alignment. Even though you know it in your head, you trust him to bring it to you. It's a training process that makes a spiritual man out of you. And a spiritual man is not a man with all kinds of garbages and disposition. A spiritual man is a man that is like Jesus. And it is only one way you can be like Jesus. is by the Holy Ghost. So, prayer becomes an, a reality we cannot do without. That's why we pray every day. But if you are not careful, it becomes a religious activity. You know that 4 p.m. every day, even if you pull your sandal and keep at home, the sandal will start trekking to 10. <laughs> if you keep your suit at home, the suit will just start trekking to 10. <laughs> so now you know 10 is just the way forward. And then when you come to 10, that's where you want to release yourself of all your weariness. <sighs> Sometimes we even go out and take a stroll. <laughs> See, we are all guilty. God is helping us gradually. That's what I'm telling you. <laughs> but we have to become decisive. 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 And hallow the one that comes to tabernacle in our midst. We have become so sense rude. That's why you see that in our generation now, revelation is heightened. Everything is about revelation. Everybody is seeing something. They want. We are ruled by our senses. If you came to this tent and then you now saw that every service, there's an angel standing here. There's one standing here. There's one standing here. And then there's a porter in this middle here that angels are descending and ascending. Every day you come to tent, your eye will be there. In fact, that's where you'll be praying. And then you become conscious. Because you are a soulish man. He said, we walk by faith. Not by sensory perception. Sometimes when you begin to grow in God, your visions reduce. You come to a meeting and then you are checking. You are trying God to give you word of knowledge for the guy who is sick. And then there is no word of knowledge. He wants you to rebuke sickness by faith. That's what pleases the Father. He said, the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. But you only come to that realm by prayer. If not, everything you know will be in your head. What journeys it from your head to your spirit is the activity of prayer. And prayer is effective when your focus is the Holy Ghost. Every time you pray outside of the Holy Ghost, every time your inspiration, your motivation, your energy is coming outside of the Holy Ghost, you have not begun. 
when the Holy Ghost mantles you, even the atmosphere will change. Because heaven is beginning to provide witness for the activity that you are carrying on land. That's when you begin to participate with the divine. That's when you begin to provide that which heaven has to offer to earth. Every other thing you are offering is dead layers of corruption. And that's why spiritual things are delicate. Because you can be doing the most spiritual thing, but you'll be outside of God all your life. Alignment. The Holy Ghost will carry you through a journey. A journey where he becomes the central reference, central focus of all you do. I heard Pastor Chris said something and I almost challenged it. But I sat down. The reason I calmed down was because this man had proof. I don't have proof. So if what he's doing is not true, then he won't have what he has. And if I claim that what I'm doing is the correct one, I should have results for what I'm doing. He said, <laughs> he said, the reason prayer is very important. And I said, wait, let me tell you something. He said, the church have said it before, that a prayerless Christian is a powerless Christian. He said, but that's not scriptural. He said, the power is not in prayer. He said, what prayer does is that it carries you into the realm of power. He said, the power is in the spirit. And he said, that's why Jesus said, you will receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come. The Holy Ghost is the custodian of power. He said, Jesus went in the power of the spirit. But there's no way you can come to the layer of the spirit where there is power until you journey by prayer. He said, so when you pray, you are focused on the spirit. Because you can't do anything unless you have apprehended the spirit. And the only way you can apprehend the spirit is by prayer. He said, that is why Jesus made declarations after he has prayed. If you know these things, you will not be, you will not be lackluster about your prayer life. You can go for a meeting and you see the dead rise and then you go for the next meeting. You are shouting, people are looking at you like this. And then some will be dozing. You can even preach the same message. The message you preach the other time and demon were screaming, ah, ah, then you say, oh boy, thank God, oh, make I carry, let me carry this message to this meeting. And then you gather, you package the message, and then you carry the same message, you are saying it word for word. And then people are looking at you like this. They want to help you, but see, they are overladen by tiredness. So, even the guy in front that wants to encourage you, he's just, he's just, he's overtaken by sleep. He tried to encourage you, but see, the body is much. <laughs> so, then you discover it's not about the message. It's about the partnership with the Holy Ghost. So when you know this thing, you will lie down and pray and ask for mercy. Ah, you will. Especially for those who are traveling ministers. Or those who minister by inspiration. <laughs> you can come with your mighty language. Then you enter as you climb the pulpit, your soul doesn't ascend. You do like this, do like this, nothing is coming. Then you discover that even the English you are speaking is not from your head. Because what happens is this. Even the sentences, they are rushing through your mind like a tap. Those who minister by inspiration, they know what I'm saying. The sentences, they run into your mind like a tap. That's why you can hear a person make 10 compound sentences without pausing. It's not because he's so intelligent. His soul is open to a frequency. That thing is rushing like a tap. If you go for a meeting and your soul doesn't ascend, you will try. Then you will discover that, oh, we need to be helped. <laughs> prayer, prayer, prayer. If you know it, every time you come to the place of prayer, you will humble yourself for God to carry you and you will be very objective about it. Prophet Ezekiel was teaching us, he said, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man. He said, the word effectual is there is well-targeted prayer, focused and objective prayer. It's not like boxing the wind. It's a lie. That guy is tired. <laughs> I think he's in the spirit. So we just go and then go and squat on something. Ah. A lie. Then the angel that is walking with you will just look at you in Jesus. Can you be so carnal? Instead of asking God to help you, your goal now is the people. What will the people say? Ah, me like this. I came for VG, I'm sleeping. And then, 
Then you see some people, they just... Ah! You will look at them and say, oh boy, this man is a dangerous man. The guy is far. <laughs> He's sleeping far in the soul Israel. <laughs> we are fake. We are kana. We don't have the fear of God. <laughs> if you are tired, why deceive the people? Is it the people that is your focus? The people are not even your first audience. And like I said, before God, who might stand? So if it comes to the place of prayer, it's God that is his first objective. His first audience is God. So if he's tired, he will ask God, help me, help me, help me, help me. Peter was falling. He didn't care about those who were in the boat. If he was thinking, oh boy, I wanted to carry out a storm. What will Andrew say? He would have died. His goal was not the people in the boat. He said, Jesus, help me. And the Bible said Jesus came quickly. If Jesus had not rushed, he would have died. He came quickly. You, you came before God and you are conscious about the other people. Who is looking at you? Who told you they are looking at you? I sat one day, somebody messed up and I pitied the person. And then in less than five seconds, I forgot. And all through the meeting, the person was feeling so awkward. Ha! And I now said, is this how this thing happens? I don't even remember this person did this thing again. And see, this person is still conscious that he's no longer part of this meeting. Because in his proud head, he thought everybody was looking at him and nobody cares about him. Instead of him to do business with God, he thought, who, who told you people have your time? Because you did mistake in the pulpit here, they quarreled you. Then you now came, you sat down. You thought everybody was looking at you till the end of the meeting. You are a proud man. If you check the heart of people, they are forgotten. They don't care. They came with their own problem. And if you are wise, you will face Jesus with your own. We waste life. We waste time. We waste destiny. Why do you come every day if you know it's not working? And if you are sure it's working, why don't you try for it to work for you? Why don't you find out how does this thing work and pour yourself into it until it begins to work? Will you waste all your life? Waste all your time? And then at the end of the day, you are old and you discover you have not apprehended. There are people that even relocate from one place to another, yet they don't touch reality. And the devil is aware. He knows that one of the gates of corruption is the gate of pride. And is willing to exploit it to the latter. You have escaped and shut the gate of the lust of, of the eyes. You have shut the gate of the lust of the flesh. So you told yourself, to her with my certificate. You told yourself, even if it doesn't work, I will pour myself to Jesus. And then you traveled from your city in Abuja. Traveled from Lagos, traveled from Port Harcourt, and you came to a creek in Benue. You hid behind the mountains. You were struggling with mosquitoes under the cave. And yet everything that is being done, you cannot access. Because you came and suddenly, the first week you came, they now say, ah, this man is a prophet. Then your three years of stay in Makod, you want to prove to everybody you are a prophet. And then you lose out the reason why you came. You came and then they say, ah, this man studies the Bible. He's a reader of the book of God. And then all of a sudden, all your life, you want to prove to everybody that you are a man of the world. Every time they ask you to speak, you begin your introduction with these scriptures. And then the waters that you came to draw, you never touch it until you journey back. Them that are wise, they have a focus in the spirit. He said, with joy, shall ye draw up waters out of the wells of salvation. Every time we join in the spirit, we have a goal, we have a focus. But you need to first of all reorient yourself. You need to change your mind. You need to realize that everything you can ever amount to is built on one foundation. That foundation is called prayer. That's why Jesus prophesied after he prayed. That's why Jesus healed the sick after he prayed. That's why Jesus went to meet the people after he prayed. The reason you have poured yourself into prayer is because the word is waiting for you. What will you do after you have stayed here all this while and then you go without an answer for the word? Satan knew that the reason we engage spiritual realities is because creation is in bondage and only the sons of God can bring salvation. That is why when he collided with Jesus, his focus was, are you the son of God? And Jesus was not distracted. 
he focused because he knew until the protocol of alignment is fulfilled, he can never go out with the power of the Spirit. The moment Jesus went out, the Bible said he went in the power of the Spirit. And he said his fame was spread abroad. His fame said that it might be fulfilled. Which was written by Isaiah the prophet. So if Jesus had not gone through that layer of training, does that mean that prophecy by Isaiah would not have been fulfilled? Yes. Because before he went there, he was a carpenter. But the man Isaiah spoke about, he said he is a light. Before a carpenter can be refined to become a light, he must have of necessity gone through the corridor of alignment. In alignment, your, your vistas are, they are refocused. Then you see beyond your circumstance, you see beyond yourself. He said, turn these stones to bread. Was Jesus not hungry? Yes, he was. Did Jesus need food? Yes. When he came home, he rushed and ate. But he was able to see beyond the circumstances. He said, man shall not live by bread alone. But by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. It is in the gateway of alignment that you are recalibrated. They told you now to go to Buruku, it may be hard. Because you have a plan, you have a, a vision, you have purpose for life, you have dreams. Until you pass through alignment, you're, you can't be recalibrated. You will only see from your circumstance. You will look upon the bread and begin to imagine how sweet it is. You will begin to imagine the impact of the hunger. But when you have been aligned, then you begin to see from the realm of God. And most times, God may not even come to do anything about it. But it doesn't matter anymore. Because what you are doing is that you are actually partnering with the divine. The reason God can be in a territory is because an aligned man has shown up. So you become more concerned about the plans of God, the purposes of God, the, the will of the Father. We have people running around with titles, apostles and prophets. But when there is money in the government house, it is the bishops that lead the way. What happens to the territory? What happens to the purpose of God for the land? There is no alignment. So they are vista still at the level of judging things based on their circumstance. They say, talk this stone to bread. They say, that is a wise counsel. You know, wisdom is profitable to direct. I actually need bread now. How come I didn't think about it? And the power is there. And they turn the stone to bread. And they become the servant of the devil. They don't know when they became, they fell from princes to become servant. Because him whom you yield yourself, servant to obey. He said the servant of him whom you are. It can, it can come as a counsel. It can come as a law. It can come as an instruction. But only wise men can begin to choose the choices of God. And the only time by which you will get there is when you have been refined through the pathway of alignment. The word of God that was given to you was to mend the cracked and the damaged creation. The Bible said through faith we understand that the walls were framed by the word of God. The word framed here is the word katakizo. It means to mend, to mend, to correct, to reconfigure. But the only men who has the power and the ability to reconfigure are the men that have been aligned. Because they will call them the sons of God. He said Jesus was the brightness of his glory. So the man that was mending creation was not an ordinary man. It was a man that have come to, he has come to a point where everything that is of humanity has been purged. When you look at Jesus, what you see is the express image of the Father. The brightness of his glory. That's a man that has the ability to mend the world. The reason witchcraft will continue in your family is because you have not been aligned. The day the gateway of alignment is complete, you will rise up and you will say, you, go and marry. By what technology will Jacob come and say, I bless you with corn. I bless you with wine. I bless you with the dew of heaven. There was no rain falling. There was the wine. A man who knows how to connect to heaven. Jesus. He's a wonder. That's why the end of alignment is power. If the truth, if of the truth you have completed alignment, your life will become an effulgence of power. You become a ruler among the sons of the Assyrians. It doesn't matter what they do. You can come to a territory and lock the gate of heaven. Even the elements of creation will obey you. We are making decrees. Nothing is happening because we are not aligned. The end of alignment is power. Apostles said we were born by power. We were created for power. 
He said, we were bettered by a God of power. He said, as many as received him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. Even the kingdom, the purpose, and the will of God, we say we want to fulfill is by power. He said, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. He didn't give you any other thing to advocate, to legislate, and to advance his kingdom. He gave you power. You enter into the gate of power when your obedience is complete. Because he said, when your obedience is complete, then you can avenge other disobedience. There are people going out trying to avenge disobediences when they are rebellious, gimmicks, psychophants, hypocrites of the highest order, inspired by darkness, and they want to change the civilization that have raised them all their lives. How do you come to contend with the demon of immorality when you are his slave? How do you contend with the demon of manipulation when you yourself you are an agent of manipulation? You think it's when you hold the mic. Nothing happens when you hold the mic. It is the God that you are yielded to in the spirit that we speak when you're on the microphone. And when these things become real, without mic, without sound, the kingdom of God will still manifest among men. The greatest feat that these men of God you see on the media today, they did. They didn't do it on the media. They did it when they were rugged and cruel men. Chief will always tell you here that we are praying now. They are holding the mic like this because we have gone to the nations. When prayer was going on here, people will run and collide with the wall. Somebody will hold the mic. Sometimes you will throw it away. You won't know because you are overtaken by the spirit of prayer. Now when you people are praying, you composed prayers by the Holy Ghost because you have known the corridor. People will think that is all there is to it. You can't change the world that have raised you. The angel of the Lord came to Zacharias. He told him that his son will go in the spirit and in the powers of Elias. But for that to be fulfilled, in Luke chapter 1 verse 80, he said John was separated into the wilderness until the day of his showing forth. Everything of that civilization had to be purged from him. So he had no appetite for anything. When he came, he came as a judge over that world. He said, Savior shall arise from Mount Zion to judge the mountains of Esau. It is only from Zion that Saviors are born. What alignment does for you is that he carries you to the path of life until you appear in Zion. When you come out of Zion, you can judge the iniquities of your world. At that time, your obedience is complete. At that time, when you speak, is the government of heaven that you are giving expression to. The power is hidden in obedience. It is locked up in obedience. And only aligned men can touch of it. A man who has aligned with God is one with him. That's why the Bible said if such men backslide, it says it's difficult to reclaim them. They, they have touched of the powers of the age to come. When they show up, what they do is that they beg the kingdom. They come with the burdens of the kingdom. If such men tell you this is it, even if that was not God was saying, God will do it because they have secured oneness with him. I looked upon the scriptures and I, was, I marveled how that Paul will be given instruction by the Holy Ghost and the point will come. He will say, but concerning virgins, he said, God did not speak to me about this. He said, but I speak as a man. What? Can the words of a man be equated with scriptures? I thought the Bible said all scriptures were given by the inspiration of the Holy Ghost. Where did he journey to in God that his own words can be measured equally with the words of God? He went to the wilderness of Arabia. He left everything and he stayed with the Holy Ghost until he taught him what it means to become an apostle. Where have you gone to in God? When you pray, where are you journeying to? When you fast, where are you going to? When you study the scriptures, where are you going to? Does it take you to the realm of God or it takes you to the fullness of your pride? Does it take you to the realm of God or it takes you to the fullness of your visions, your desires and your ambition? Your orientation is distorted. So you have nothing to offer the world. Because the world is already a progression of darkness. Demons, entities from the demonic realm are coming with different kinds of wisdom to bet different civilizations, different operations, different dimensions. The only thing we have to add to this world, it is what is found in the landscape of heaven. And only men who have journeyed there can bet it here. If you have not gone there, you can't bet it here. It is only people who have traveled to the spirit 
that can bring spiritual resources because the resources are not in the natural they are in the spirit I want us to pray today for at least 30 minutes because in recent times my burden is not to see the power of God move it's something I can do consciously but people are slain they, be, they, they amount to nothing nobody is making decision for Jesus Nobody is making a commitment for Jesus. Even the people that are in the ministry that you think, ah, thank God he has secured these ones. When you see pastors discuss, if you are not careful, you will fall down and your faith will crash. When you see pastors negotiate honorarium, honorarium, pastors, the goal of the meeting, the goal of the travel, the goal of everything they were saying on the altar is to create enough giving so that honorarium will be big. And then they bargain over on Aurelia. If you see some of the discussions of pastors, then you will begin to cry. It is not about what we are doing. We are we standing with God. People need to begin to make conscious decisions so that their life can profit the world to come. Apostle says salvation is a capital God put in your heart. He said, but what you do for God is the profit that you will bring upon that capital. By the time you journey to eternity, what, how many blocks of the kingdom would you have put in your own dispensation? Because it is a house God is building. He is building it through time. By the time time is accomplished, that world will descend as the new Jerusalem. Which block would you have put there? All the faith you have exercised is this to receive things from God. What have you contributed to the building of God? Something is rising in the spirit. Men are laying blocks, laying blocks, some by their blood, some by their witnesses. The Bible said, These women, he said, they caught forth their sons back to life. He said, Some in the face of deliverance, they rejected it. He said, That they may have a better resurrection, a resurrection that will give them profit before God. Because they realize that the value of life is not in time. The value of life is in eternity. So how much of eternity you superimpose in time is what will determine who you are in eternity. So they said if only our death would be a witness to Jesus, we will die gladly. We didn't have the opportunity to preach the gospel. But now you have attacked us, you have deceived us. And you want us to choose death because of Jesus. This is the only opportunity we have to witness. We will die gladly. If you have read church history, you will begin to wonder if it's the same Jesus you believe. You will even pray that God should help, let them be enough space in the new Jerusalem. Because if you see what people did, you will wonder if you will have a slot there. I heard stories of, of women like Felicita. A pregnant woman, they kept her for seven months, waiting for her to deliver. Because the child is innocent. Perpetual and Felicita, her and her maid, they said, we would have killed you now, but since your baby is innocent, wait until you deliver. What was she waiting for? They were waiting for her to deliver so that she would be killed because she rejected Jesus. And she was aware of the kind of death that she would be afflicted with. After she gave birth, two days later, a woman that gave birth with all the injuries, they brought her to the arena, stripped her naked, and they released white beasts upon them. And the lions tore them apart, and they were praying why they died. What kind of conviction did they have? I heard story of, of, of John, the beloved a disciple. His name was called Polycarp. At the age of 86, an old man. They went and carried him. And he said, the people that came to arrest him, he gave them food to eat. He was at rest, dying for Jesus. And when they dragged him to the arena, they said, deny Jesus. Old man, we'll leave you. We don't want to kill you. You've been a good man. He said, 80 and 6 years have I served him. And he has never offended me. He said, how can I do this evil? And he was set on fire. He was set ablaze. He was burned. And why they burned him? The Bible said he looked to heaven. They stopped. He looked to heaven. As the flame rose to heaven. He didn't struggle with that. You see, the Jesus who believed that they believed. You are still struggling over ambition. Your life has not been demanded of you. God is just saying, go to a, a rural place and it's difficult for you. 
do you think you have really believed? It is only men who align that are relevant in the hands of God. Apostle said, alignment is the strength of giants. When you see a man who is a giant in the kingdom, he has understood the technology of alignment. These stories are many. Ahead of the Moravian brothers. These men, the only way they could preach the gospel in the city where they were going, because they are, they are country, they are not allowed in that city. So what they did was that they sold themselves as slaves. Because that was the only way they could enter the city. So they sold themselves, collected the money, gave it out, and they carried them to the city as slaves. If by any means they enter that city, let them be witnesses. God told them to carry the witness of Jesus to a city. There was no way they could enter. They sold themselves as slaves. If such a man wants to preach John 3.16, he will preach it with life. Because he knows what it truly means for God to die for sinners. You may quote it. I tell you the truth, you don't know it. If you know it, the moment you receive it, everything about your life will be to give the same to another person. And your vision will not be too big to stand against it. What we do is not an activity. It's not a religion. It's life being dispensed through human vessels. It's God being on the manifestation. It's God being presented like a theater through human vessels. Every time they touch you, everything that will come out of you is God. Because your life has been submitted on the altar as a sacrifice. You may think it's about the pulpit. When you come to the pulpit, then you discover the microphone is not enough. Everything about your life is supposed to sing the witness of Jesus. When you go to the market, your utterances, the people you greet, the people you talk to, the people you live with, your life is supposed to be an amplifier of the life of Jesus. It has nothing to do with pulpit. How many times do you pray? I traveled to Oka two weeks ago. I preached in seven meetings in three days and I almost died. Then I discovered the pulpit is not enough. Because you meet more people in your everyday life than you will ever meet carrying the microphone. Your life is supposed to be a witness. And that can only happen when you submit yourself as a sacrifice. Because everything about this realm is destined to corrupt, to die, to waste. The only thing that we pass through this realm is what is sacrificed to Jesus. And it is the quality of sacrifice that will determine the value you have in the world to come. Can you ask Jesus to help you? I don't motivate people while preaching anymore. If the word of God is not enough to convict you, nothing will convict you. Because the Holy Spirit only bears witness to the world. Some of us have come to a point where our heart is so hardened. Jesus called it an evil heart. He called it an evil heart. Why do you pray every day? so that you can journey deep into the realm of life. It is until you come to that place, you cannot dispense of the verities of God. You can't. Even if you will it, even if you try, even if you charge, you can't. Because it only happens by the Spirit. It happens by the Spirit. You ask Jesus to help you. Because until you are confronted with your worst fear, you will not, you will never can tell whether you are truly convicted or not. The day you collide with your worst fear, that's the day you will tell whether conviction has been born in your heart. The message I came with, I couldn't even preach it. God is speaking to somebody. I came with a message on my iPad, but I couldn't look upon it. Sometimes you come for a meeting, striving for your soul to ascend, and then you come in an ascendant state, and the Holy Ghost steps you down. He said, no, talk to them. Let them hear what they need to hear for the season.
don't need to. No, no, no. Just keep it calm. Don't scare anybody. Let's learn to travel. Moses said, be still. You will see the salvation of God. Let them learn to travel. See, when we stand and we are praying loud, some of us can pray for long. I hope you enjoyed this video. And I believe that you were blessed. If um, you were blessed by this video, make sure that you click on the share button and share it to a friend. And also make sure that you like the video so that YouTube can recommend this video to other people so that they can also be blessed by the message. If you have any question, please make sure that you contact us and we'll get back to you. And also if you are watching this video and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior, I want you to make that decision. Just contact us in the description. Call us and let us lead you to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. And lastly, make sure that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the, that notification bell icon. Turn it on so that when new videos are uploaded, you can be notified. Thank you so much and see you in our next video and prayer section. Bye.